Yuya is a young boy who has a body different from that what our normal world calls a pretty or handsome body. He is fat, and he is huge. He looks much older than his age, and he is most discriminated against by everyone, including his parents. He has two siblings who are opposed to him, they look good, and they are handsome compared to him. Growing up as a child, he knows that the world isn't one that will accept him. He has no one who loves him, and no one wants to be friends with him. But he keeps on with it, hoping that one day, he will help someone. At the series' is beginning, he is crossing the road alone as his huge shadow overshadows the entire ground. He keeps walking and thinking about the life he is living until he hears a voice around him. Inquisitively, he tries to find where the voice is coming from, and he eventually sees that it's from a young girl, Kaori, who has been ambushed on the road by older men and about three of these men for that matter. They ask her to join them for tea, but she refuses. She tells them she wants to leave and that they should leave her to go, but they refuse to leave her. They tell her that she should remain with them and play with them for a while despite seeing that it is obvious that she isn't interested. She keeps begging them to let her go, but they refuse to do that. They pin her to the wall leaving her with no chance of leaving. Yuya feels the girl needs help, and one of the reasons he has been encouraging himself to stay alive is that one day, someone will need his help, so seeing her in that condition makes him feel like helping her, and he goes to meet the men. It's obvious he isn't that courageous, but he does it regardless. The men notice him around them and ask if they can help him. He looks at them for a while before telling them that he can see the young girl isn't interested in what they are saying, and if they can, they should leave her. They wonder where he has gotten his audacity from, and they bounce in him. All that can be seen after that hit is the splashes of his blood which is seen in front of Kaori. She feels bad for him as these men hit him until he almost dies. When he collapses, Kaori's convoy arrive, and the men realize they may have killed someone, so they run away. Kaori goes nearer to him and asks him how he is doing. She asks if he wants to visit the hospital, and the convoy also come out. He tells her he is okay and that's not the first time he is experiencing things like that. He walks home alone, and as he reaches his house, which was given to him by his late grandfather, he remembers the words of his late grandfather that in this life, no matter what a person is going through, he shouldn't let go of an opportunity to do kindness to another person because that's where he will get his happiness from. He opens the door to the house and lies on the bed, looking at his grandpa's portrait. He has always been lonely all his life. He was bullied everywhere he gets to, from elementary school to middle school, and even at home, he is discriminated from his two siblings. His mother will tell him that he shouldn't put his clothes on with that of his siblings, and they will also laugh at him. Despite the fact that they are attending the same school, his younger siblings have never behaved as if they knew him. The only person who was kind to him was his grandfather. He would sit him down and teach him all the things about life. Unfortunately, his grandfather died. He remembers the day his grandfather died and how he stayed in front of the corpse crying because he knew his life would be dark from that moment. After his grandfather's death, the older man leaves him with all his property, including the house. His parents try to get this properties from him, but due to the great groundwork that his grandfather has done, they can't succeed. They angrily disown him because of that so now he lives alone in his grandfather's house and takes part-time jobs to make a living. He is used to being bullied, and all he has gone through in middle school doesn't get him too angry. He is eventually graduating from middle school, and he is so excited about it because he feels that it will be the end of his bullying period. He goes to the school 61st graduation ceremony, and as every student collects their yearbook happily, he collects his with tears on his face because his page on the book is filled with foul words like fatty, ugly, and every other insult. He takes the book and walks away from the school. On his way home, some of his bullies come to him. The boy hits him on his back, and he falls. He asks him if he thinks that because he has graduated, he will be free from him. He says that for the sake of bullying him, he has to take an extra year in middle school. They hit him, and all the students look, including his siblings. He begs them that he needs to go for his part-time job, which is newspaper delivery, and he needs to get there on time. But they don't care. That evening after they are done with him, they leave him and go home. He packs himself from the floor, and he goes to his part-time work, but it's late already. His employer asks him why he is just coming, and if he thinks the job is a joke, he tries to explain what has happened, but his boss tells him he has called a replacement and from the following day, he shouldn't come to work again. Yuya is tired. He walks home sadly and sits and eats the cup noodles he has brought on his way. He blesses the food and eats it. He goes to the bathroom to clean his face, and when he sees his ugly face in the mirror, he gets angry. He punches the mirror, wondering why he has graduated from middle school when the bullying he is passing through won't stop. 
He wonders what is the use of his life at that point. He punches the mirror until the mirror breaks and scatters. Blood drips from his hand, but he doesn't care. He stops punching the mirror and he goes to hit the wall. As he does so, a door opens. He realizes that there is actually a hidden door in that house. He sees several artifacts in the room, and he wonders where they are from. He remembers that his grandfather used to travel within worlds, and whenever he returned, he would keep what he brought. He figures that's the room his grandfather puts everything he brings from the trips. He sees a door by the side of the wall. He wonders what the door is for and he goes to open it. When he does so, he gets a notification. The system notifies him that the appraisal skill has been acquired. The endurance skill has been acquired. The title master of the door has been acquired. The title of master of the house has also been gotten. So also the title of the other worlder and finally the title of the first time traveler to a different world. It's the last one that catches his fancy first. He wonders what is the title of a first time traveler to the different world and when he clicks it. The system brings an explanation that it is a door which suddenly appears on a planet and connects to another world. Even the gods do not know why it appeared, and its destination isn't set in advance, but once it connects to another world, the destination is fixed. The door's master can utilize its many options, but the door can't be destroyed. He eventually understands what it means and tries to know more about the other titles and skills. When he clicks on them, the system brings several explanations. He sees some new skills that he doesn't understand at all. He sees asset conversion, transfer and restriction, and some other skills. He tries to check his status, but to his shock, he is of zero status and all his skills are on level zero. He also sees that he has an item box. He feels that if he gets to the other world, he may call other skills, so he enters into the other world. And when he gets there, he checks through the window and confirms that he isn't in the same world. He is excited that he has left the wicked world for a more comfortable one, and he sees a letter on the table. He tries to read the letter, but it's impossible. At that point, he gets another system notification that he has gotten another skill called the language comprehension skill so he can comprehend the language of that world. He takes the letter and reads it. In the letter, he sees that the owner of that house is about to commit suicide, so he leaves that letter for the first person who gets into that world and enters that house. The first person who enters that house will have ownership of the house, and he will be the only one who can enter the house. He can use and control anything on the property, and the property is his. He looks around, looking at what could be valuable in the property. He sees several weapons, and he takes the first one, which is the ominous or the sharp edge. He takes the sword out and uses it to train. He falls down because he can't use a sword, and when he returns it, he gets the skill of swordmanship. He goes to use the spear, which the system calls the absolute spear. He trains with it and takes the death scythe. He then goes for the infinite gauntlets, and he uses it to train. After training with all the tools in the house, his system tells him to drop the weapon, and he gains the skill called true martial art. A very long weapon comes out in replace of the ones he has dropped. He holds it thinking of what to do with it. He suddenly sees a bloody ogre in front of the compound. The ogre makes noises and tries to enter, but the fence stops the ogre from entering. He closes his ears but remembers he is the only one with access to that compound, so there is no way the ogre can enter, but the ogre keeps disturbing him with noises. He considers using the weapon in his hand, and he uses it to stab the ogre. The ogre dies immediately, and its remains disappear. After the ogre disappears, several other body parts of the ogre remain. He sees the magic stone bee, the fang of an ogre, the folds of the blood stain ogre, and also the gauntlet of the blood stain ogre. He sees that his levels have increased, and he can also add levels up. He checks his notification status for any new thing, and when he is done, he feels it's time for him to return to his world. As he gets to the door of the other world, the asset converter converts all the things he has earned into cash. It's about 1,500,000 yen, and he can spend it in his normal world. He takes the money and returns home. The next day, he feels some pain in his body. As his body shrinks, he sees that his chest has changed and also his body. His clothes no longer size him, and he tries to check himself in the mirror, but he has broken his mirror. He needs new clothes, but he can use his otherworldly powers to create clothes for himself, so he wears them regardless. He returns to the other world and goes to the field to plant herbs and other magical leaves. He gets used to the way of life in that world, although he still fears about what he will go through in his normal world. He is used to the animals disturbing his fence in the other world, so anytime he sees them, he doesn't bother himself and he just takes his weapon to kill it. After killing that day's beast, he gets the Hell Slime Core, Hell Slime Jelly, and Magic Stone. 
When he leaves the other world that day, he changes the money and plans to use it to get a new uniform. He measures for his uniform and sews it. He returns to the other world, where he kills a goblin. He is concerned that school resumes the day after and he will be bullied. He resumes school, and all eyes are on him. He doesn't know how good he looks and why everyone is looking at him. He goes to his class, and his usual bullies come to him. They ask him if he is a transfer student, but he tells them he is Yuya. They refuse to believe he is that pig, and even his siblings are jealous and shocked. He runs to the bathroom to check his face, and when he sees himself, he is shocked too. His new life is that which he isn't used to. He becomes not only the talk of the class and even the talk of the school, but he walks around, and his siblings even get jealous of him. That day, the school receives some strange visitor. A car stops in front of the school, and the driver opens the door for a young girl. The girl turns out to be Kaori, the young girl who Yuya has saved at the beginning of the series. She steps down from the car, and coincidentally, Yuya is also around the car park. She calls his name out, and she asks if he knows her. She tells him that she knows him and he has slimmed down a lot. He wonders how she knew him, especially because she looks like a girl from the wealthy part of the city, so he doesn't know how he could have gotten in contact with her. She reminds him of the girl in front of the tea shop who some men want to molest. He immediately recognizes her, but he remembers that he didn't tell her his name that day. He asks her how she had found out his name. And she admits that although it is very rude of her, she had investigated about him so she would know more about him. And it is during her investigation that she found out about him. She tells him she has come to appreciate him for saving her. But he tells her that she doesn't need to worry and that what he has done isn't that important for her to come all the way to appreciate him. She tells him that although he may not take what had happened that day as important, it is quite important to her. She says she has come to appreciate him for what he has done. She introduces herself as Kaori Hauju, a student of Ausei Academy. The others look at her, including Yuya's siblings. They have recognized that uniform is that of Ausei Academy, the great school in the city that every student wants to attend. Kaori continues. She tells Yuya that she is an officer on the Ausei Academy Student Council, and she has told her school about him, so she wants him to join her school. He is shocked that school is for the upper members of society, and it's only for geniuses, so it's not possible for him to be given free admission. The teacher who has followed Kaori comes to speak with Yuya. She tells Yuya that Kaori's father is the chairman of the school's board, and when he hears about how Yuya has saved his daughter, he decides to reward him by giving him the admission. Although that admission is a valuable opportunity, Yuya doesn't feel like he deserves it. He tells them that he didn't really do much to deserve the reward and even if he wishes to attend that academy. He can't attend because he doesn't have the academic qualification to get admitted into such a school. Before Kaori could try to convince him, his selfish siblings step in. They say that they are great students and they have the academic qualifications and they are also good at sports so since their brother isn't qualified, they would like to take his position. Kaori shuns them. She tells them that she has also investigated them, and she knows how they have always treated Yuya, including how they treat him like he isn't a member of their family and how they bully him. She says she can never allow people like that into her prestigious school. She tries to convince Yuya. She tells him that their school isn't really interested in academic performance, but in the behavior of students, and he has the prototype behavior that they want, so he should join her. The female teacher feels that if they bring Yuya to their school, he spends a day experiencing the great life of that school, and he will feel the wish to join them. He doesn't want to miss school for that day, but the teacher tells him that they will inform his class teacher about that visit, and he will be allowed to go. He reluctantly accepts to follow them. He enters the car, and his siblings are angry that he is the one getting such favors and not them. As they enter into Ausei Academy, he looks around the school and the noble building, that's the best school in the city. And he has heard that anyone who gets admission into that academy has his future sets for him because the school is a school of geniuses and no one there can fail. He had never thought he could get an offer to attend such a school until the offer was in front of him, and he feels he is dreaming. The driver opens the door to the car and asks him to come down. They take him to the chairman's office, where he meets Kaori's father, Tsukasa Hauju, the chairman of the board. Tsukasa welcomes him. He tells him that when he heard of how he had courageously saved his daughter, he had thought of the best way that he can reward him, and he feels the best way is to give him admission into their academy. He says that the admission fully covers his tuition fee, and he doesn't have to bother about money again. Tsukasa bows to him, and he begs Tsukasa to raise his head up and tells him what he did isn't really that big. Kaori insists that what he did was the greatest thing anyone has ever done to her. She says that several people saw her in that place, and they went their way, but he waited there, and he saved her despite knowing that he had no physical power, 
and he would be beaten. She tells him that's the type of attitude they call for in their school, so it's best he joins their prestigious school. He refuses the offer again. He claims that although the school is the best anyone can go to, he doesn't feel like he is a good fit for that type of school because most students in the school are geniuses, and he is nothing to write home about. Tsukasa asks him what he knows about genius. He explains that genius are extraordinary people who have natural talents from heaven, and they can do anything they set their mind on. But Tsukasa tells him that is not genius. He tells him that the ability to do what you set your mind to do and to ensure that you commit yourself to what you want to do is hard work, and that's what they encourage in their school. Yuya argues that there are people with inborn talents, and these ones are the ones who should attend schools like this, and Tsukasa admits that he is right. He, however, says that talents are not always inborn and, most times, it is cultivated. He tells him he can also enjoy the school and cultivate his talent. He feels Yuya won't accept that offer like that and says he has made preparation for Yuya to spend that day on tour around their school so he will know if he is really interested. They hear a knock on the door, and a teacher, Sawada, from the science class enters. Tsukasa introduces Sawada to Yuuya. He tells him that Sawada is popular among students for her great teaching skills, and all the students love her, so he wants Yuuya to spend his day in Sawada's class so he can know the school better. Yuuya leaves the office with Sawada. Sawada enters the class to introduce him to the students while Yuuya stays outside. He overhears how excited the students speak and when Sawada tells them that she has a surprise for them. He feels the students in that class will be so special, and he will have no place among them. But he concludes that no matter how bad that class is, it shouldn't be as bad as his former class. He enters and introduces himself to the students, but they are all quiet. He wonders what they are thinking about, and he feels like crying or running out of the class. But he doesn't know that the students are thinking about how handsome he is and how their heart is about to burst. Sawada notices his tension. She tells her students that they are making him uncomfortable and says him to sit behind the class. He sits beside a young girl, and as the class starts, Sawada asks him to ask the girl, Hayaudu, to share her textbook with him. He finds it difficult to ask, but even before he talks, Hayaudu takes her textbook closer to him. He looks at her and tells her it's nice to meet her, and she replies to him. He is worried that she looked at him in a weird way, and she is angry at him. He bows his head because he is so scared. In Kaori's class, she is thinking about him. She hopes he will have a fun time at school and decide to join their school. During the class, he feels the class isn't so much different from that of his normal school. But the students are more interactive, so it makes the courses understandable. He enjoys the class until the class ends, and after the class, all the students surround him asking him several questions. Some ask him which school he comes from. Another ask him if he has a girlfriend, and some are interested in knowing if he is in an idol or pop group. He doesn't know how to start answering the questions, and a student, Ryu, comes to his rescue. Ryu tells his classmates that they are making Yuuya uncomfortable, and they need to leave him to rest. He goes to Yuuya and introduces himself as Ryu. He tells Yuuya that he wants to eat and asks if Yuuya wants to eat. Yuuya follows Ryu, and they go to the canteen. When they get there, he is amazed at the kind of food on their menu. The food is also for very cheap price. Ryu tells him that if he doesn't know what to choose, there is also an accessible menu for all. As they buy the food, another student, Shingo, invites them to his table. They eat with Shingo, who asks Ryu if he watched the anime he recommended the day before. They talk about anime, and they also ask Yuya if he is in any club. He tells them no and asks them the same question. Ryu says he is in the going home club. That is because he is one of the best students in the school, and every club wants him to join them. Since he can't join every club, he decides to be in the going home club. He asks Shingo what's his club and Shingo says he is in the game club. Shingo brings out his video game, and they play together. Yuya wonders if the teachers won't punish them for playing games, and Shingo tells him that the teachers are assured that they won't play it in class. As they eat, he notices the other students are looking at him. He asks Ryu if it's because of his clothes but Ryu says it's because of his face. After the school day ends, he returns to Tsukasa's office, and Tsukasa asks him what he thinks about the school. He admits that the school is great, and when Tsukasa asks if he would like to attend the school, he wonders if he is worthy of the school. Tsukasa tells him he should know his worthiness but says he is sure he is worthy. He accepts to remain in that school, and as he comes out of the office, he sees Kaori. He tells her he has accepted to say, and she asks if he has any schedule after that day. 
They both go to a marketplace where every student goes to. He asks her if she has been there before, but she tells him that due to her father's position, she finds it difficult to make friends. They take food together, although he is concerned that if he eats too much, he may return to his former shape. They share a bite out of their meals, and they have a fun night. He returns home and decides to go to the other world, especially because he feels if he gets enrolled in the school, he may not have free time again. He gets there, and he sees the beasts outside his fence. He kills the beast but realizes his stats aren't increasing as fast as before. He feels he may find better and bigger beasts to kill outside the fence, so he should fight his fear and go there. He goes outside of the fence, and he sees a goblin killing every other monster. He sees a young girl, and he is shocked that there are humans in that world too. He goes to fight the goblin, and after throwing his weapon, he jumps and hits his face. He tries to speak to the girl, and she calls his attention to the goblin behind him. The goblin attacks him, and he fights back, and he kills the goblin. He goes to the girl, who faints immediately. The young lady asks him who he is before she closes her eyes. He returns to his normal world, and he starts ironing his uniform. He keeps thinking about this young girl because he is scared that she may have encountered more danger after he left her there. He closes his eyes and imagines the forest, and he sees that some knights have come to save her. He is glad that she is fine, and he feels reassured that he has saved another person. He keeps ironing his clothes, and he remembers that the clothes he is putting on are the same ones he has been putting on since the day he reduced weight. Although he washes the cloth every day, he feels it will look like he is wearing just one cloth. And since he is now rich, it isn't a bad idea if he tries to buy more clothes. He leaves the house and goes to the boutique. As he arrives at the store, all eyes are on him. Everyone wonders if he is just falling from the sky because he looks so handsome. He radiates beauty in class, and they wonder if he is an actor. Talking of an actor, a director is also at the mall to shoot for one of his show. He is disappointed that his main lead hasn't arrived, and he gets angry at the main lead's manager, asking why the main lead, Shu, hasn't come. He hits the manager repeatedly, asking when Shu will be around because he doesn't have much time to waste and he can't keep waiting. Shu's manager receives a call, and he assumes that the caller is Shu. After his manager picks up the calls, he tells the director that Shu isn't replying to his texts, and he doesn't know where Shu is, but a person has told him that Shu is on his way. The director gets more angry. He says that he hates casts who are nonchalant about their work and they behave stupidly, and Shu is one. They are shooting a show about a girl who has met her boyfriend in the mall, and they are taking pictures. The female lead, Mew, is already at the mall, but there is no way they can have that shoot without the male lead. He tries to apologize to the female lead for wasting her time, but she is kind, so she isn't worried about all that is happening. She tells him that she is fine. However, everyone in that casting office has other engagements for that day, and they can only have that shoot at that time, and Shu is delaying them. He is so angry at Shu, and Mew also receives a call about the shoot she has after that shoot she is running out of time, so also everyone on that team and they need someone. The director says he can no longer wait, so he will go around the mall and find someone to do the work for him. On the other hand, Yuya is in the mall trying to find the best cloth for himself. He remains the center of attraction in the mall, and everyone looks at him. He doesn't know the clothes to pick from as he is caught between two clothes. He looks at the two wares, and he wonders which one he should pick. Then two girls come to meet him. He sees them and gets scared. They try to talk to him, asking if he has any other engagements after he leaves the mall. He first assumes that they are sellers who want to use panic sales marketing. They ask him if there is anything he wants to get at the mall and if they can help him choose. They are interested in being friends with him, but he doesn't feel worthy of it. He wants to reject them, but he also knows that if he leaves them in a horrible way, it will mean he is a bad person, and he will hurt them. He keeps thinking of the best way to reject them without hurting them, and after he thinks for a while, he tells them that he is sorry. He can't follow them because he has another scheduled engagement after he leaves the mall, and the girls are dumbfounded. They stand there as if they are in shock for some minutes. The director and one of his assistants walk around the mall, trying to look for a photogenic person for their shoot. His assistant feels like there is no way they can get such a person at the store, and the manager gets angry and hits him. He puts his head on the clothes and tells him that he must find a person. They have done it before, and they have to do it again. They continue their search. While walking on the stairs, Yuya wonders if he has addressed the girls well and if he hasn't hurt them. The girls are still shocked, and they keep standing. They suddenly regain their composure, and they scream that they have met a god. 
They claim that after meeting Yuya, they are sure they will live longer. He looks at them and sees that they are okay, so he wants to continue his tour around the mall. As he walks away, the director sees him. The director immediately knows he is the one he has been looking for. The director tails Yuya until he follows him to where he wants to pick his dress. Yuya notices that someone is behind him, and he turns. The director speaks to him. Well, Yuya is now having a shot as the lead actor. You may wonder how that has happened. After the director meets Yuya, he tells Yuya that their lead actor has refused to come early and every crew of that shoot has another engagement, so they need an alternative. Yuya feels that since it is just to take pictures, there is no reason why he shouldn't help them. He starts striking poses with Miu for the shoot. The director complains that he is too moody and he isn't laughing. The reason is that he isn't used to shoots like that, and Miu tries to make him comfortable. She tells him it happens like that for every first timer, and she tries to make him feel well. She goes closer to him for the shoots, and she puts her body nearer to him. He finds it uncomfortable to have her chest around him, and they go to the walkway to continue the shoot. He sees how dedicated Miu is to that shoot, and he comments that Miu is an awesome person. He says that they are in the same age bracket, but Miu takes her job very important, so if he has to stay comfortable to ensure Miu gets the perfect shots, he will do so. Miu returns and hugs him for the shoot. She even puts her body more closer to him. Meanwhile, in the other world, the young lady who he has saved turns out to be a princess. She can't forget him, and she keeps thinking about him. She suddenly stands up from her bed that day, and she walks outside the house. The knights ask her where she is going, and she tells them she is returning to the forest to find the man who had saved her. They warn her that the forest is not for a living thing and there is no way the man that has saved her will be there. She says that she knows that and that is why she will find him there so that if she sees him she will save him. She claims that as a member of the royal family, it's her responsibility to save him and repay him for what he has done for her. Her father gets concerned, asking her if she has forgotten what happened to her the last time she went to the forest, but she says that is why she isn't going there alone this time around. She is going with the entire night so they can protect her. They try to convince her to change her mind, but they all know she is quite stubborn, and they ask her where she inherited her wild side from. In the mall, the shoot officially finishes, and the actors rest. He sits beside Miu, and one of the crew brings them drinks so they can rest properly. He drinks it, and Miu looks at him. She tells him that he looks tired and asks if he is tired. He admits that he is actually tired, but he immediately starts sneezing when he looks at her. She smiles at him and brings him a handkerchief asking him to use it to clean his face. He refuses her offer and tries to use his clothes but remembers the clothes aren't his. He tells her that the cloth is quite valuable and he could never expect that he would be putting on that type of cloth. He says he had always looked at actors and models with admiration because he knew he could never get into their category. He never could imagine himself in their world, especially because of the type of life he was living before. He remembers when he was fat too. He tells her he admires her work ethic and how she works efficiently. He asks her why she has decided to be a model, and she explains that it is because she wants to be seen. She tells him that her parents were always busy, so she thought of a job that she could do where everyone will see her, including her parents, and modeling seems to be the best idea. With her few years of working, she has gained several fans despite her not too impressive works, and these fans actually rally around her. They send her letters and gifts, and they encourage her. So she decides that if she can encourage them that way, then she is doing a good deed. She hopes that one day, there will be someone who will pursue her dream because of her, and she wants to be an inspiration. She admonishes him that he could do the same. He asks her if she thinks he is capable, and she tells him yes. Suddenly, the male actor who should take the role, Shu, arrives. He comes there complaining that he is tired as he had gotten drunk the night before. All the viewers see him and scream because he is quite popular. Yuya asks Miu who he is, and Miu explains who Shu is to Yuya. Shu comes to meet Miu and tells her they should have the stupid shoot and go out together. He pins her to the wall telling her that she saw him the last time and she didn't come to meet him. She is afraid of him, but he tells her she should take alcohol with him. She complains that she is still a minor. <laughs> Women. But he refuses to hear. Yuya sees that she is uncomfortable, so he goes to tell Shu to stop, but Shu refuses. Shu asks who he is and tries to throw a punch at him, but Yuya falls him. The director comes, and he tells Shu that they have taken a video of his act, and if he does anything, they will post it. Shu leaves there embarrassed as everyone cheers Yuya up. The director asks if Yuya would like to join their agency and work with them, but he refuses the offer because he feels he isn't experienced. The director doesn't want to force him, so he tells him if he changes his mind, he can contact them. He brings several bags of clothes, telling him that he would have loved to pay him, 
but that won't go well on the agency's account, so he has bought him clothes. Miu also tells him that she wishes to see him again before they depart. On Miu's way home, the director says he wishes to work with Yuya again, but he can't force him. He sees that Miu's face gets red while talking about Yuya and infers she is in love. Yuya returns home and goes to the other world. Meanwhile, in the forest, the princess and her knights are overpowered by the monsters, and they can't retreat. Yuya comes to their rescue. He kills the monsters and also treats the injured knights. The princess comes to him, telling him that she has a request. She tells him that she wants to marry him. After being asked to marry her by Princess Lexia, Yuya is dumbfounded. The captain of the guards, Owen, cautions her, seeking to know what she is trying to do. He wonders what she means by proposing. He asks why she has chosen to express her proposal in the open and in such a loud manner. This is because he thinks a woman of her status and position should not be seen doing such a thing. Even though Yuya has saved them, he claims that they still know nothing about him and have to be cautious about whatever they do. At that point, the ignorant princess blurts out the fact that it was love at first. She asks if falling in love at first sight is a problem. With this question, Owen notices how angry the princess has become. On the other hand, she cautions him to stop nagging and telling her what to do, even though he is her guard. In his defense, Owen states that if she had behaved in a manner appropriate to her royal standing, he wouldn't have to. Meanwhile, while they argue, Yuya tries to inform them that they won't be safe if monsters show up. Furthermore, he offers to let them come to his house for safety. Hearing this, Owen is shocked. He wonders how a person would live in this forest, but Princess Lexia is thrilled at knowing this. Getting to Yuya's house, Owen continues to be surprised that a person would live in the darkest regions. He finds the mere thought of this to be impossible. However, he is shocked to see that it actually is true. Shortly after, Yuya offers them some tea. After that, Owen formally introduces himself, stating that he serves as the captain of the Knights of the Kingdom of Arcelia. Just then, Princess Lexia introduces herself as the first princess of the Kingdom of Arcelia. After that, she thanks him for saving them from the dreadful situation. While Yuya doesn't see it as much of a feat to be thankful for, he is very surprised to find out that she is a princess. To clarify, Owen states it once again, trying to prove to him that Lexia is no ordinary girl. He states that she is second in line to the throne in terms of royal succession. Hearing this, Yuya gets scared since he had been speaking so casually with her. To calm him down, Owen assures him that it isn't an issue since they did not come on an official visit, and most importantly, since he had saved their lives. Just then, he asks for Yuya's name. The latter introduces himself as Yuya Tenju. Hearing the name, Owen ponders upon it. He feels it is an unusual sounding name in the kingdom. Princess Lexia, on the other hand, thinks it could be a name belonging to a noble family. However, Owen thinks that is unlikely, since he could be a mage wandering the world for research. In a shocking thought, Princess Lexia thinks he could be royalty, fantasizing about how beautiful the love between royals would be. This, though, gets Owen frustrated at how badly the princess has fallen in love with this man. Finally, he thinks Yuya could be a spy but still doesn't think that's the case. After a while, watching them contemplate, Yuya calls for their attention. When he does, Owen reveals that they have actually come because they were looking for him. Shocked to hear this, he wonders why. In response, Owen states that the princess had said that someone rescued her from danger in the deepest regions. This had made them come all the way here in search of him to offer their thanks. The princess lets him know that she wished to do so on that day, but was unable to since she lost consciousness. For this, she apologizes, but Yuya doesn't see it as an issue. Furthermore, the princess pours out her heart, citing how her heart has not stopped racing since the day he rescued her. This makes her ask him once again to marry her. Hearing her say her concluding words, Yuya wonders what part of it counts as a thank you. While he is happy she feels that way, he thinks marriage is too sudden. Hearing this, she comes to the conclusion that their love cannot be so simple. This is because she has seen it written like this in every romance novel, stating that the start of anything is the most crucial. This leads her to suggest that they start off as friends. After a brief moment of contemplation, Yuya accepts to be her friend and they shake at it. Watching them shake hands, Owen assumes that the princess gratitude has been received by Yuya. However, there seems to be another reason why they have come. Princess Lexia's father, the king, asked Yuya to come to the palace in order for him to express his gratitude in person to the one who saved his daughter. Hearing this, Yuya is thrilled. The thought of having an audience with the king is one that had never crossed his mind. While Owen seems to understand how he feels, he reveals that he cannot leave the royal command of the kind unfulfilled and must return to the palace with a reply. With this, he accepts to do it. Meanwhile, going to see the king would take five days of Yuya's time, 
and Owen pleads with him to prepare. At this moment, Yuya is reminded of Golden Week but stops halfway before revealing his true identity to them. Then, he asks to know if the king can wait a little longer for a time when he would be free to make the trip. In response, Owen reveals that they are obligated to accept his terms since they are the ones making demands. After that, Owen leaves with the princess. While leaving, the princess promises to them all she can to make him her accept her proposal, promising to win his heart when they next meet. Meanwhile, the one who had sent the assassins to the princess is angry that they failed woefully. One of them narrates the encounter, stating that they succeeded in separating the princess from her knights like they had planned. However, they strayed into the darkest region, where they unfortunately encountered powerful monsters which wiped them out. Listening to the story, the masked leader seeks to know why Princess Lexia remains alive after such an encounter, but the assassins have no information on that. This annoys the masked leader, who assures them that they will not have a second chance. Shortly after, when he gets to his private room, he takes off his mask, determined to take his revenge on Princess Lexia for what she had done to him. The next day, Yuya marks the date for his meeting with the king on his calendar. That day happens to be the day he resumes at his new school, Ausei Academy. He prepares and heads out, ready to face a new world. However, when he leaves his house, everyone marvels at the sight of him, commending his physique and handsomeness. Getting to school, the school, the chairperson congratulates him on his enrollment. While there are things he hopes to discuss with Yuya, he states that he doesn't have much time since he was going on a trip. However, he instructs Yuya to enjoy his life in school. Shortly after, Yuya gets taken to his new class, where he is introduced to the students WH9 already know him from the trial enrollment. While the home teacher introduces him, he notices some friends he had made at the enrollment waving and smiling at him. This gives him peace of mind. Later that day, the students have a football match and one of Yuya's friends, Ryu, seems to be dominating the field. He dribbles past the rest of the players so easily, winning the admiration and love of his teammates, the girls and Yuya, who thinks he is so incredible. While watching the match, Yuya is met by a girl who asks him if he is just there to watch the game. In his defense, he states that his gym clothes have not arrived yet, prompting him to stay by the sidelines. Just then, she introduces herself as Kid Kazama, and the two watch the game together. Back in the game, Ru's team advances so well, leaving another student with a chance to score. He, however, shoots the ball in Kid's direction. It almost hits her, but Yuya acts fast and kicks it away and into the net. The sight of this shocks everyone, as they have never witnessed anything like this. After that, Yuya asks Keed if she is okay, and the already flustered Keed replies positively. At that point, the one who had shot the ball comes running, apologizing to Keed for his mistake. Keed, on the other hand, doesn't see it as an issue, since she didn't get hurt. After that, he thanks Yuya for the save introducing himself as Akira Ikonos. He tries to attach a classy nickname to himself, but Ryu and the other students insist on not ever hearing anyone call or refer to him as that. While he tries to prove his point, everyone bursts into laughter as it is clearly obvious that they wish to mess with him. In the women's changing room, the girls talk about Yuya's abilities and all seem to be attracted to him. They refer to him as the ideal prince for being so good at sports and being kind too. At that moment, the daughter of the chairperson of the school, Kaori, entered into the room. Just then, Keed wastes no time in narrating the ordeal to her. While her seeming exaggerated explanation looked hard for Kaori to understand, one of the girls breaks it down in clearer terms. At that moment, the topic of debate becomes whether or not Yuya has a girlfriend. Most of them, however, believe he does since a boy like him who is so attractive would hardly have one. They, however, wish he doesn't, and Kaori seems to be more bothered about the answer to that mystery. Little did they know that he had a pending proposal in another world. Later that day, Yuya is in class as he watches the girls do some exercise through the window. Kaori sees him and waves at him from afar and he waves back to her. Shortly after, a group of thugs riding bikes come bursting through the gates and into the school. This causes the teacher to leave the class, but before doing so, he orders them to remain there while he moves to calm down the situation. Outside, the other teachers try to calm the situation while the students observe through the window. One of them recognizes the gang as the Red Ogre, the most dangerous group of delinquents in the area. Hearing the name Red Ogre, Yuya figures out that it is Araki's gang. He is, however, shocked to see his siblings with the gang. While the thugs continue to drive around, Kaori bravely steps forward, demanding to know what business they have at the school. At that moment, the leader of the gang clarifies her identity as the one they have come to seek. Seeing Yuya's siblings, Kaori immediately recognizes them. They, however, blame her for looking down on them and allowing their idiot brother into the academy. 
Due to this, they are determined to exact their revenge. In her defense, Kaori threatens to have the police there soon, demanding that they stop this immediately. Hearing this, they let her know that it would be a while before the police arrive, giving them enough time to do what they want, one of which is to abduct her. Immediately, the leader orders his men to grab her. Seeing this, Yuya turns to help her but finds himself feeling scared, which is weird. He ends up losing consciousness but regains it by slapping himself hard. Just then, he exits the class through the window, jumping down four floors and charging towards the leader of the gang. Seeing him, the leader recognizes him and orders his men to deal with him. When they attack, he easily wards them off and goes to save Kaori. In his attempt to do so, he is blocked by a huge member of the gang who thinks it would be easy to defeat Yuya. However, he is shocked to his bones when Yuya easily throws him off his feet <laughs> and into one of the bikes. Then, he walks up to Kaori, who has now been freed by the men who held her out of fear. At that moment, the leader of the gang boards his bike and charges at Yuya. Fortunately, he figures out in time to dodge the attempt and shoves the bike away, causing the leader to crash into the stairs. Are you serious? Just then, the police arrive and take the thugs away shortly after. The leader, who has now been captured, grabs one of Yuya's siblings and is about to strangle him to death for bringing them here when Yuya comes to save him. This angers the leader who charges at Yuya angrily. He is, however, stopped by controlling power in Yuya's eyes which he uses to render him powerless. Shortly after, Yuya gets a chance to talk to his siblings and he states that he would never abandon his family. This makes them go on their knees and apologize to him for all they have done. That night, Yuya gets ready to go exploring. However, just as he opens the door to leave, he is reminded of the words of the sage named Owen. He had met earlier who cautioned him about not being aware of the kind of place he intends to go exploring. Apparently, it is the darkest region of all the most dangerous regions in the land. Furthermore, he is told that the monsters he defeats so easily are of a level that could see them destroy large cities if they attacked in a pack. The monsters Owen speaks about happen to be live fully in this region. Remembering this, Yuya is left wondering about what kind of place the sage lived in. He, however, chooses to ignore the words of Owen and heads into the regions to continue exploring. Getting there, he kills a monster easily by cutting through it. He believes that going deeper in the forest would provide him with stronger monsters to kill. This first kill doesn't do justice to his thoughts. He thinks the forest isn't as dangerous as Owen had claimed it would be. Now bored and with no other monsters in sight, he decides to call it a day and continue his exploring some other time. Just as he turns to leave, he hears the cry of a dog from a distance. The dog, on the other hand, is being beaten by an ogre and happens to be defenseless. Getting there, Yuya takes his time to evaluate the ogre's strength and realizes that it is very powerful. The attacking stats of the monsters amounts to 2,000 and he is no match for it. Upon realizing this, he opts to turn around and leave the dog to its fate. However, when he does so, he is bothered, mainly about the fact that his grandfather, whom he looked up to, would never do such a thing. This makes him decide to help the dog. Immediately, he charges at the monster with his and in fear, hoping to divert its attention at least. Also, ready to face whatever wrath his good heart would incur from the monster. Surprisingly, this was just enough to kill the monster and save the dog. The fact that he screamed loudly and charged aggressively when all he had to do was poke it made him feel embarrassed. Although he remembers how he had beaten a bloody ogre a while back when his stats were at one. Looking closely at his weapon, he wonders who the sage that had made it was, that he could make something so powerful. Leaving that thought aside, he focuses his attention on the now severely injured dog. The dog, at the time sees him as a threat and is ready to charge at him. He, however, brings out a liquid substance that can help it recover and offers it to him. Just as he offers it to the dog, it passes out. Hurriedly, Yuya feeds it to the dog, just in time for it to regain consciousness. When the dog wakes up, he becomes extra friendly with Yuya and even licks his hands. Just then, Yuya seeks to know what happened to its parents and why it is alone. Although the dog denies being lost, it admits to not knowing where its parents are. Seeing how pitiful the dog is, Yuya offers it a chance to live with him. Without much contemplation, the dog agrees and is filled with excitement. He assures the dog that he has a place that would be suitable for it and asks to know what the dog wants to do. Almost immediately, Yuya is shown information about a new skill that allows him to make monsters into allies. Before accepting, he checks the dog's stats and realizes that it is very strong. After that, he agrees to be allies with the dog. Now that they are allies, Yuya feels they need to decide on a name for the dog. Considering the dog's jet black fur and color, he decides to name it Knight. Happily, Knight jumps on him and the two get ready to head back home. 
The next day, Yuya checks his stats to see that he now possesses some daily necessity items. This is because he now owns a dog. One of the items happened to be a brush which he uses to scrub Knight's fur, and the dog seems to be loving it so much. While doing this, he checks his stats to see if there are any progress and realizes that they haven't increased. Seeing this, he finds it strange, especially after he has defeated a lot of opponents who were more powerful than him. Just then, he realized that assumptions won't solve the mystery of leveling up as he is hopeful that he would figure it put eventually. The next morning, Yuya leaves Knight alone at home and heads to school. There, he informs his friends about his intention to go to a pet shop. At first, they wonder what he seeks there since he isn't known to have a pet. To end their curiosity, he informs them that he had just taken in a dog the day before. Hearing that he has a dog, one of his friends, Keat is thrilled and immediately asks to see a picture of the dog. This she does while she almost has her face in his. In reply, he states that he doesn't have a picture of the dog since he doesn't have a smartphone. Hearing this, one of his friends is shocked that there would anyone in this era that does not have a smartphone. They find the mere thought of it to be inconvenient. In his defense, Yuya thinks he has never felt the need to have one, but promises to consider having one soon. Back to the issue of a pet shop. His friends recommend one close to the shopping district which also has an animal clinic. They urge him to check it out. This, he agrees to. However, he asks them to come with him but they each give an excuse, stating that they can't come since they have plans. While the others give excuses, Keed raises her hand and opts to go with him. While she accepts to go, she makes it seem like she is suggesting it. Happily, Yuya asks her to come with him and she agrees, although she assumes that it is a date, but Yuya doesn't hear her clearly. Later that day, Yuya arrives home to a very happy knight who jumps on him immediately. He informs Knight that things would unfortunately have to continue this way since he would need to go to school. Just then, he reveals the things he had bought from the pet shop, stating that he had got them with the help of a friend. One of the items happened to be a collar which he places on Knight's neck. He informs Knight that he doesn't have to wear it indoors but will only wear it when they go out. After putting it on, he seeks to know if it's tight on the dog but it signals that it isn't. After that, the two decide to go outside for a walk. While walking in the park, everyone admires Yuya for being so handsome and his dog for being so cute. Although the attention they give Yuya and Knight is so glaring, the two remain unaware. Just then, a man passes by and says hello to Yuya. Hearing this, he is surprised that someone would say hello to him for just walking. This makes him realize just how amazing Knight is. Shortly after, he is met by a friend of his named, Kaori. When they see each other, they are surprised. Immediately, she asks about who the little dog is, and Yuya introduces Knight to her as a new member of his family. Seeing how cute he is, she bends to pet him and this draws the attention of everyone around once again. They are all made to see a beautiful combination of a handsome boy, a beautiful girl, and a cute puppy. On the other hand, Kaori finds Knight to be very cute. She seeks to know what breed he is but Yuya doesn't seem to know. He states that he had only found the dog and took him in. Kaori is surprised to hear this looking at how happy the dog is with Yuya. For everything she says, Knight makes a sound. This makes her call him smart, stating that it feels like he can understand all that she says. Well, he actually can. While they talk, an old female friend of Yuya calls out his name. Turning around, he sees that it is the fashion model, Miu. Miu's appearance puts Yuya in an awkward situation as he seeks to know why she is there. In reply, she tells him that she lives around the area and takes a walk there around that time. Then, she seeks to know who the lady and the dog he's with are. He introduces Kaori as his friend and Knight as his family member. Seeing Mew, everyone around immediately recognizes her as the fashion model. Mew, on the other hand, wastes no time as she leaves, revealing that she has one more reason to take a walk there often. That reason happens to be Yuya. When she leaves, Kaori asks if Yuya and Mu are together but he denies abruptly, stating that they are just friends. Just as she is about to leave, a woman screams in a distance, announcing that her purse has just been stolen by a pickpocket. Seeing this, Yuya directs Knight to chase after the man while he calms the woman down. Shortly after, Knight approaches them, dragging the man by the collar. After that, Yuya instructs Kaori to call the police. Hearing this, the man immediately springs up, brings out a knife and threatens to stab her. He charges at her with a knife, but he's immediately stopped by Yuya who grabs his hand and hits him to the ground. This makes everyone around clap and thrilled about what they had just seen. Later that night, Yuya and Knight continue exploring into the forests. Together, they battle various beasts and use their individual abilities to take care of the monsters they encounter. While advancing deep into the F9 rest, they are met by an ogre, the kind that had beaten Knight earlier. Without wasting much time, Knight charges at the monster and finishes it off without Yuya's help. 
Going further, they meet a very dangerous magical beast. Seeing it, Yuya hides and trues to analyze the monster's capabilities. While doing so, the monster finds him out and is ready to attack. When he notices this, he has no other choice but to attack. He immediately instructs Knight to have a go at it. Their first attempt at an attack is futile as they realize that the monster has two different forms of magical powers on its horns. Realizing this, Yuya instructs Knight to create a distraction that would give him an opening to attack. Just as he instructed, Knight used his speed to appear at different points in the forest, confusing the monster, and leading it to unleash its power. This gave them the chance they needed to strike a fatal blow, causing the monster to die. Taking a look at what the monster had dropped, Yuya is surprised to see a bath. Checking it out, he realizes that it will be dangerous to have a bath there and decides to take it home with him. At home, Yuya and Knight have a refreshing bath before continuing on their hunt for monsters. Going further, they are met by a very fast monster. Looking at its stats, Yuya realizes that the monster would definitely have a weakness if they hold out for a while. Just as he said, its weakness shows itself, allowing them a chance to strike the monster. Killing this monster significantly increases the stat of both Yuya and Knight. Advancing deep in the forest, the two arrive at a dumping grounded with no living creature. Just then, Yuya's attention is drawn to a book laying on the ground which is called, The Book of the Sage. After acquiring the Book of the Sage, Yuya trues to remember who the sage is. Just then, he figures out that the sage is the one who used to own the house in the forest where he lives. In the book, the sage writes about how he was able to do everything, from magic to martial arts and fencing. While this might seem normal for a sage, he also could cook, sing and paint, proving to be a master of everything. This had led him to enter the realm of the gods while still alive. While there, he claims the gods asked him to join them, but he declined their invitation. Through the book, the sage assures Yuya that the strength he possesses is more powerful than he knows. However, he is warned about the fact that this could lead the humans around him to fear him, just as it happened during his time. Furthermore, the sage states that he had felt so alone after achieving all that he did. Due to this he doesn't wish Yuya would take the same path. After reading this, Yuya seeks to know what he can do to make sure he doesn't scare the people around him. Shockingly, he hears the voice of the sage, instructing him to build human relationships which he can trust. Having heard this, Yuya thinks he is imagining things. He continues to read from the book which states that he has to trust those who will stay by his side even when everything is laid bare. Thinking about this, Yuya describes himself as someone who had no friends until recently, so doing this would be difficult. Going further, he is instructed to seek friends at his own pace. To help him, the sage promises to inscribe in the book one thing he wishes to know. After a short contemplation, Yuya says magic. After stating his wish, the voice of the sage is heard once again, revealing that he has just filled the book with everything he knows about magical theory. Of course, we know theories do not really help as much as practical but Yuya should be able to figure it out, right? After thanking the sage for granting his wish, he is told that someone like him who comes from another world does not possess magical pathways. This means he is unable to use magic like the humans of this world who produce magical energy in their hearts. However, since Yuya lacks this ability, the sage offers or bestows his magical pathways upon Yuya. This surprises the hell out of Yuya, who is told that the magical pathway he is about to possess is quite valuable in this world. Instead of seeing them destroyed, the sage hopes Yuya can use them. Furthermore, the sage states that if, in turn, Yuya gets suited for such power and gets to live a life in which he can hold his head high, it is enough. At that moment, he receives the magical pathways of the sage. The weight of the power takes a toll on him, causing him to be slightly unstable. However, when Knight shows concern, he assures his dog that he is fine. Just then, the sage states that he would like Yuya to be happy and not have to experience all that he has gone through. Before leaving, the sage blesses him with happiness and good fortune. For this, Yuya is thankful, as he hopes the sage will find peace. Ready to explore the magic he has just been bestowed with, Yuya comes to realize that magic is the materialization of one's imagination. However, he further realizes that without the magical energy he has just been gifted, magic would have no use. To begin, he is instructed to sense magical energy. To do this, he closes his eyes for a while hoping to tap into his magical energy. After a while, he feels it flowing with him. Looking closely at himself, he realizes that these must be the magical pathways the sage passed on to him. To be sure, he asks Knight, who confirms it immediately. For the next step, he is instructed to gather magical energy in the palm of his hands and imagine the magic he wishes to invoke. Seeing this, Yuya wonders why there are no incantations. I mean, this is unlike other magic films we've watched where there has to be an incantation before magic can work. 
Well, this is surely different from the norm. The book instructs him to name the magic himself, making it easier to invoke when the time comes. In order to practice what he has just learned, Yuya heads to an open space in the forest with night. There, he takes his time to imagine it. Then he names the magic water ball. In a brief moment, there is a formation of a water ball in the air. Seeing this, Yuya gets excited. He gets even more excited when he sees that Knight is able to replicate this magic. This makes him realize that they are both magic users. Next, they imagine shooting the water balls at the tree and it does as they want it to, creating a hole in the tree. On the other hand, Owen arrives at the palace and is in the presence of the king. He asks him if he was able to meet Yuya and he confirms the success of their mission. Furthermore, Owen states that Yuya lives in the darkest regions just like Princess Lexia had said. He, however, informs the king that Yuya seems to be from another country, since his name sounds unusual. Unaware of the words he utters next, Owen asks the king to admonish Princess Lexia for proposing marriage to Yuya, which gets him shocked. After saying this, Owen realized he had said too much. As much as he tried to cover up what he said, the king insists that he repeats himself. When he finally does, the king angrily grabs a sword and goes on a rampage. He is angry that a dirty weasel like Yuya would dare to seduce his daughter. While this is going on, Owen, whose big mouth is obviously the cause of this, wonders why everyone in the royal family has to be so troublesome. The next day, at school, while the teacher takes attendance of students in the class, Yuya spends his time remembering the words from the Book of the Sage. There, the sage talks about how all he happens to know is not general knowledge. Instead, Yuya is instructed to consider carefully when to use the things he has learnt from the book. While still contemplating these words, the teacher informs the students about their off-campus studies scheduled for the next week. This happened to be new information to Yuya, who claims to not have received any information about it. One of his classmates breaks it down to him, stating that it meant to make them get used to the new environment and they will be spending two nights together. At that moment, the teacher announces the teams for the off-campus studies. Fortunately, Yuya gets paired with two of his close friends, Keed and Akira. For the fourth member, they get a girl named Rin Kanzaki. Seeing her team members, Keed is optimistic that it will be a very lively team. She looks forward to the off-campus trip. However, Yuya states that he doesn't have a rucksack to use for the trip, although he contemplates using an old wheeled suitcase his grandfather left behind. Not wanting her friend to use such a thing, Keed suggests that they go shopping for a rucksack. After school, they meet up with Kaori, who thanks them for calling her. Seeing Kaori, Shingo is excited about hanging out with her. She, however, states that she hasn't come to hang out but to help Yuya with his shopping, especially since shopping with friends is fun. Hearing Kaori call Yuya her friend makes Ryu envious of him. While they state that she has an unapproachable aura because her father is the chairman, she urges them to be free around her since her father is the important one and not her. This makes them more comfortable around her. However, looking around, Yuya realizes that Akira is missing. Shingo delivers his apology for missing the shopping since he had plans. Getting to the store, Kaori helps Yuya with picking up a very good bag. This makes the others impressed at how good she is at this. Carrying the bag, Yuya likes it. He thanks Kaori for making such a choice for him. Later on, after everyone had gotten all they needed, they decided to have some fun. Due to this, they all head to the arcade. The place happened to be almost empty since they had come on a weekday. Iuya, however, is amazed at how huge the arcade is. While admiring the view, Shingo calls their attention to a Hufumi toy he has always wanted, although he has to win a crane game to get it. Wanting to help his friend, Iuya offers to try. Even though it is his first time, he happens to know how to move it due to his heightened power of perception from leveling up. Looking closely, he detects the weakness of the toy and taps the crane once, getting the toy on his first trial. This gets everyone excited and they each begin to demand help in getting what they have always wanted from the crane game. One by one, he gets them what they want, causing them all to be happy. Seeing them in this state, Yuya never imagined that something he did would make them as happy as they are. Although this is the first time Kaori has been to an arcade, she thinks Yuya is amazing at it. After enjoying the games, the boys decide to head to the 7th floor for some tea while the girls go to the 13th floor, which has the girls' fashion store. Meanwhile, at the moment when the two separate, a wire happens to be cut and starts to spark somewhere in the building. Unknown to them, they all head to their intended locations. The boys enjoy a tea break and have a laugh when Yuya and Ryu talk about how bitter their coffee is. Having had so much fun, they agree to come back again. At that moment, the fire alarm is heard and a voice tells everyone to evacuate the building due to a fire which has broken out on the 10th floor. 
This fire happened to be coming from the arcade they were just in. At that moment, Yuya realizes that the girls are on the floor above, which will make it harder for them to evacuate the building. Getting to the elevator, the boys ask a security guard if he has seen three girls come down but he replies negatively. At that moment, Ryu calls them to find out if they have left. But Keed tells him that they can't get out in time and are still on the 13th floor. Without wasting much time, Yuya runs past him up the stairs. He orders Ryu and Shingo to escape while he charges desperately towards the 13th floor. He is determined to protect the smiles of his friends which he had seen earlier today, keen on saving them no matter what. Getting to the source of the fire, he makes use of his magic and covers himself in water and air. Then, he runs through the fire and eventually gets to the 13th floor where the girls lie unconscious. Kaori happens to be slightly conscious and hears him call out his name, just before passing out. Seeing the girls, he carries three of them, extends his protective water magic to them, while looking for an available exit. With no other option, he breaks through the ground, heading straight for the ground floor. When he gets down, he is relieved to find out that they are all fine. The girls seem okay as they receive treatment and Kaori's father thanks Yuya for saving her. He, however, finds this to be awkward. Furthermore, he finds it hard to explain how he had saved them, but is glad he did. Later that day, when he gets home, Knight runs up to him excitedly. Seeing the only family he has, he gets ready to prepare a feast for dinner, and Knight seems extra excited about this. Yuya returns to his house in the alternative world, and he tries to read about magic. He reads that magic is the manifestation of one's imagination. But before magic can be manifested, there is a need for the person to have magical energy, which is the root of all magical skills. The book continues and says that when there is magical energy, there is no magic a person can't use or perform. He realizes that for him to use the teleportation skill, he needs first to imagine where he is going to. Since magic is the manifestation of imagination, if he can imagine his destination, he will get there. He prepares with his pet knight, and he imagines a part of the forest that he wants to get to. After thinking about it, he immediately gets there. He is shocked that he could eventually try it successfully, and he is also excited that with that skill, he will be able to get to wherever he wants to get to as fast as possible and even runs back home very fast. He recalls that the only way he could get to that forest is because he imagined the forest, which means he can't go to anywhere he is unable to imagine, and it also means he can't visit a place he doesn't know. Irrespective of that, he is excited. He asks Knight if Knight is also excited, and the dog gives a happy gesture. He brags to Knight that with that magic, he can come to the house very early and even prepare his food timely even though he is in the other world because he can now teleport. They eventually settle inside the mountain, and they set out to start their adventure. Yuya brings out his magic light, and he uses it to light the forest. They keep walking inside the cave until they eventually encounter a monster. When they sight the monsters, they set out to fight, and within split seconds, they both defeat the two monsters. He is excited because of his much himself, and Knight has grown, and he comments that they now complement each other better, and they are a good team. They put their hunting rewards into their magic bag, and they continue their exploration. At the end of the day, they gather together all that they had gotten from that day, and their outputs are so plenty. He applauses Knight for his great work and keeps the items. He tells Knight that it is about time that they return back home so he can go to his home too, but Knight gives a sad gesture. He notices that Knight doesn't want to stop the exploration yet, but he has no choice. He explains to Knight that they have no choice and it isn't the case that he also doesn't want to keep exploring the forest with him but he has to return home early so he can prepare for the trip that he has at school. He begs Knight to please understand things from his point of view, but Knight runs towards the mountain. He wonders why Knight is behaving in such a way. He screams behind the pet and chases him. He calls him back, but Knight refuses to stop until he reaches the mountain. Yuya goes to meet him there and asks him what he is doing. Knight frowns at Yuya and looks at him in an annoying manner. Fortunately, Yuya understands their means of conversation, so he asks Knight if he wants him to conceal his appearance, and Knight nods in response. Yuya immediately conceals his appearance and watches. He sees a young girl injured by the tree, and a pack of elite goblins is around her to attack her. Yuya immediately removes his concealment and attempts to save the girl, but Knight drags him back by his shirt. He asks Knight if he shouldn't go, and Knight says, yes, he remains with Knight as they watch the confrontation. The head of the elite pack attempts to hit the girl, but she dodges and attacks back. Suddenly, she tries to escape, but they find her, and they hit her to the wall. Yuya wonders how that has happened. He confirms from Knight if they can now interfere, and Knight nods affirmatively. The young girl has been injured, and she has fainted. 
Yuya goes there with Knight, and they attack the pack of goblins. After they finish, he attempts to carry the girl, but he notices there are eyes around him. He uses his skills to check around and sees that there are several other goblins there. In fact, they are in high quantity, and there is no way he can defeat them by just fighting. So he decides to use a new skill. He brings out a whip from his weapon box, and he uses it to wipe off all his enemies at once. He doesn't know the whip is that good, it is the divine whip, and it is a whip that gains another tail each time it swings and which always hits his targets. Once it is wrapped around its target, pressure is applied to rip the target to pieces. He returns the whip, and he carries the girl. He feels he has been able to wipe off almost all the monsters in that part of the city, if not all, and he wonders if Owen and her team will be able to visit the forest without confronting any monsters. He doesn't know what to do with the girl in his hand. He feels he needs to watch her until she recovers, and he wonders if he should take her home. But Knight signals to him that he shouldn't take the girl home. He doesn't know what to do because he doesn't want to leave her in the forest. Fortunately, the girl wakes up. She wonders where she is, and when she sees that she is in a person's hand, she screams and asks him to leave her. She falls off from his hand, and she hits her head again. He goes closer to her and tells her she is injured. He brings out the all-cure herb juice and asks her if she will use it to cure her injuries. She wonders who he is and why he has such a herb, but she doesn't say anything. He feels she may not trust him enough to drink from him, so he asks if she wants him to drink from the juice first. But she tells him it's fine, and she takes the bottle. Immediately she drinks it. She feels so much better. All her injuries get cured, and she appreciates him. She introduces herself to him as Luna, and she asks him where he has found her and says she came to the forest to train. But she encountered a pack of elite goblins. She claims she has tried to run away from them, and she got exhausted in the process, which is why she fainted. He tells her it is all good, and when she asks where the goblins are, he tells her he has killed them. He introduces her to Knight and tells her Knight is his partner. He tells her his name, and since they are done, he feels the need to go. She wonders what he is also doing in that part of the forest, so he tells her he is also there to train. She feels there is no way a person can come to that forest to train, but since that is the same lie she had told him, she couldn't counter him. She appreciates him for saving her and tells him they had the same purpose. She asks if he is the one that carried her and says she is dirty and she must have stained his clothes. She tells him she is too dirty and there is no way she can return to the city like that, so he asks her if she will like to have her bath. He creates a bath for her, and she enters the bath. He asks her if she enjoys the bath, and she tells him it's the best thing she has ever seen. She asks where he has gotten such a bath from, and he tells her he got it from Crystal Deer. She feels it's a nice thing that he is carrying it along. She tries to tell him that she actually had a purpose for coming to the forest and she had come there at a customer's request and not to train. But she doesn't know the best way to have such a conversation, so she keeps it on her mind. She tells him she still has some more training to do, and she wants to get to some part of the forest. She asks if he will like to accompany her. She tells him she feels if they keep training together, she will get stronger at a very fast rate. Yuya considers refusing her offer, however, he feels if he refuses it, she will have to keep training by herself, and she may get injured in the process. He feels leaving her alone to remain there feels more difficult than staying with her, so he will stay with her that way. He won't be concerned about her safety. He accepts her suggestion and tells her he will keep training with her, but it can't be every time. She feels so happy she opens the veil to the bath and jumps to look at him. She is still naked, and he doesn't know, so when he turns, he gets so nervous and begs her to close the veil. She reminds him that they will be together for some time and it will eventually happen, but he refuses. He starts training with her, and within a few days, he acknowledges that he has learned a lot from her, and she has also learned a lot from him. They will eat together, drink herbs when injured, and fight together, and he feels he is also getting stronger from their joint training. During one of their training, Knight gets another title called Goblin Eater. One day as they train, they encounter some goblins, and after he hits the goblin for the first time, he throws it at Luna, who attacks it with her string blade and throws it to Knight, who eats it. After killing the goblin, he goes to meet her. He tells her she is now very good, and the way she is, she can confront an elite goblin on her own. She refuses to be flattered. She claims they win because of him and Knight, but he tells her the string blades on her hands are very sharp, and they were so sharp the day he met her too, so she is strong. She wishes to continue training with him, but he tells her that from the following day, he won't be available for their training. She feels sad and asks him why so he tells her he is going for an off-campus study trip at school. She accepts to let him go, and they decide to enjoy their last day together and have a nice bath. 
After the day's adventure, Yuya goes to have his bath. He wonders why Luna has allowed him to have his bath first, and she enters the bath telling him it's because she wants to have her bath with him. He begs her to allow him to go out, and he attempts to leave, but she hugs him from behind. She tells him the time she has spent with him is one of her best days and she has never thought she would have so much beautiful time. She appreciates him for what he has done for her and says she wants to repay his favor by washing his back. When she finishes, he turns and he screams. She wonders what has happened to him and he tells her the towel has come off her body. She screams and he closes his eyes. The following day, Yuya takes the school bus and follows his classmates for the off-campus study trip. On the bus, they play card games and he wins all his colleagues consecutively. One of them says he is quite lucky. He feels tired, so he goes to rest. Before sleeping, he wonders if the reason for his good luck is because his luck stat is full, and wonders if seeing Luna naked was also a luck. They arrive at the off-campus building, and it's marvelous. The teacher brings them inside, and she tells them how the trip will go. She narrates that it's two days and one night trip, and they are to source their food by fishing and to pick edible vegetables and mushrooms. The students are concerned that they may eat poison, so their teacher tells them they must show the teacher the food before eating, and in case they eat poison, their school doctor is there to cure them. The school doctor comes with a herb that the students assume will be poison because she has a weird way of performing her medicine. The students are excited that they will be sleeping in that mansion, but their teacher tells them the mansion is for teachers, and the students are to group in a group of four and camp outside. In Yuya's group, they divide themselves into two. The first set goes for mushrooms and vegetables, while Yuya and Keith are to go for fish. When they get to the river, the other students are there. Yuya finds a shallow part of the river with fish and goes there. He remembers Luna's words about how strategic monsters are, he uses her advice to pick the fishes, and he gets so much. He remembers her and appreciates her advice. On the other hand, Luna destroys some masks with her strings. She remembers Yuya and admits he is a good person, but she is a trained assassin and a member of the Dark Guild called Headhunter, so she has to say goodbye to him. Yuya returns from the sea with Keed, and they meet Rin. Rin asks them how their adventure was and if it wasn't too stressful and while Yuya tells her that he struggled to catch some fish, Keed tells her they didn't have any struggle because Yuya single-handedly caught all the fish in the river with his hand. She goes nearer to the bucket of fish to see the amount of fish Yuya has actually captured, and she is also very shocked. She comments that it seems he has a lot of physical strength, the same way he had displayed his physical strength during their physical classes. Yuya sees that his last teammate, Akira, is lying on the floor. He asks Rin what had happened to Akira and if their mission was so difficult that Akira collapsed. But Rin tells him they should just leave Akira like that because the boy is trying to rest. Akira screams at Rin. He tells the other teammates that it was Rin who made him into what he is, and she is the reason he feels that weak. On the other hand, Rin surprisingly asks him if he is still alive. Akira tells his colleagues that it is going well, and that they began their mission by picking all the available vegetables. It continues like that until Rin sends him to pick up a vegetable on the cliff, and when he gets there, he sees a poisonous mushroom and mistakenly eats it, and Rin also puts him out as bait to a bear. Rin doesn't even give him any attention. Also, Yuya is more interested in the fact that he ate poisonous mushrooms. He reminds him that the teacher had told them poisonous mushrooms could kill, and asks Akira if he is doing well. Akira sarcastically tells them he will be fine if all his teammates are doing well. Yuya isn't interested in that excuse. He immediately goes to meet Akira and tries to touch him. He asks Akira if he is doing well, and he uses his magical eyes to see if there is something internally wrong with Akira. His system shows him that Akira is fine. He is relaxed, and he tells Akira to ensure he doesn't put himself in danger again and should also rest. Akira is shocked that someone cares so much about him. He screams Yuya's name and tries to hug him. The girls also determine that during the field test, they will do their best. The team meet at their tent, and Yuya asks Rin what she has gotten with Akira. They go to the table of vegetables, and Yuya is shocked that his teammates have gotten that many vegetables. He commends their work, and while Akira and Rin argue as to who did the best work during the field mission, Yuya uses his eyes to check the vegetables and also their names so he will know which one is edible and which is poisonous. After checking through, he removes the poisonous vegetables, and he is indifferent about the black truffle and Japanese yam because he doesn't know about them. He decides they will ask the teachers if the vegetables are poisonous or not. He asks his colleagues who will cook the food, and there is silence between them. None of them is ready to take on such a responsibility, so he smiles at them and tells them they should all go to the hall and show the teacher their vegetable first before they decide on who will cook the food. 
They arrive at the hall, and while he waits for their teacher, Sawada, he sees Kaori. He calls out for her and walks to meet her. She greets him with smiles all over her and asks him if he is enjoying their field mission. He admits that he is enjoying it but says he will prefer it if it wasn't a mission where they have to feed each other separately. She calms him down, and it's all because the teacher wants them to learn well, and he will enjoy the mission regardless. Her teammates call out for her, and she bids Yuya goodbye and meets her friends. After Kaori leaves, Akira runs to meet Yuya. He is shocked that Yuya is friends with Kaori and says his friends, Shingo and Ryu, who had gossiped about it, were right. He asks Yuya if he is that cordial with Kaori and says he also wants to be friends with Princess Kaori. Yuya is shocked that Akira is calling Kaori a princess because he doesn't know she is a princess, so Rin explains that technically, Kaori is the daughter of their school's chairman, which means she is a princess in their school. Her cheerful smile and beautiful and friendly personality are other reasons people call her princess. Eventually, their teacher, Sawada, arrives, she checks all their vegetables, and she is happy with them. She tells them that not only are they the ones who had brought the highest vegetables, but they are also the only team with no poisonous vegetables. She is glad that with their great work, she will surely get a bonus at school. She tells them they have increased her chances of getting a bonus, but they can't stop there because their cooking will also be graded. She begs them to ensure that they cook the food very nicely. She asks who will cook, and all the other members point to Yuya. He reluctantly accepts the responsibility, and when they tell Sawada he is the one cooking, Sawada hugs him. She begs him that he should put all his efforts into ensuring the food is well made because her bonus is at stake. He gets pissed at her selfish intention and begs her that she should at least pretend as if she cares about them and not her bonus, but she doesn't care. The team return to their tent to cook. Yuya starts with the cutting of fish before he preps the vegetable. He starts frying his fish, and eventually, the table is filled with food and side dishes. When he finishes, he serves his colleagues and looking at the food. They are sure the food will be very delicious, however, when they take the first bite, they are speechless. Sawada and two of her male teachers are walking past their tent when they see the heap of food. They are also interested. Sawada asks if they can take a bite, and Yuya allows them. They take a fish, and when they also bite it, they are speechless. Yuya feels he has prepared rubbish. He begs them to comment, and they all scream that the food is so delicious. They tell him that if the best food they have ever eaten in their life, and they all get into the business of consuming the food. A few minutes into it, the initially filled table becomes empty, all the plates of food return to being just plates, and they are overfed. Sawada gets emotional. She asks Yuya if he would like to marry her. Everyone at the table is shocked. The question has come out of the blues, and they wonder if she is serious or joking. She further explains that growing up, she had been more interested in her research and her enjoyment so much that she didn't have time for men. She doesn't know how to cook or do any laundry, and she is also tired of being single. She says the reason she had come for that field trip is that she wants a bonus, but she doesn't know that she will meet the best cook who cooks more than any other person she has met there. She asks Yuya again if he would like to marry her. At this point, everyone there protests. The teacher reminds Sawada that it will not look well if she wants to marry her student, and Keed even tells her that there are several reasons she can't marry Yuya, and she won't allow the union. Yuya wonders if the reason everyone is against the union is because he is a very bad person. He eventually speaks up. He tells Sawada that her request came out of the blue. He comments that she is his teacher, and he won't deny that she is a good teacher. Before he finishes his statement, Sawada jumps at him and puts his head on her chest. Everyone begs her to release him, and he also struggles to breathe. He eventually raises his hand like someone almost dying, so Rin tells Sawada that Yuya is seeing heaven. Eventually, Sawada releases Yuya, who says that he is already seeing the heavens in reality. After the long day, Yuya returns to the other world to meet Knight. He greets his pet, although he tells him he will leave soon to join his colleagues. He immediately starts preparing Knight's dinner. After he finishes the preparation, he sees Knight enjoys the food. He comments that he likes to make people happy, and he feels really happy whenever Keed, Sawada, Knight and the other people enjoy the food he has made for them. Time is far spent, and he needs to return to the field trip to have his bath so he leaves the other world. He joins his colleagues in the bathroom, and he notices all the students are looking at his chest. He asks Akira why everyone is staring at him, and Akira asks him if he can't see that he is built differently. He asks him why he is in the going home club when his body is this awesome and claims he should be in clubs where he can use such bodies. Akira says it's cheating that he has such an awesome body while he has nothing. 
Kaori also arrives with her friends, and Rin calls Kaori to see how big Keed's chest is. Kaori and the other students get jealous, Rin teases Keed that her chest isn't as big as teacher Sawada's own, and they reveal to the others that after eating Yuya's fold, Sawada asks Yuya to marry her. Keed says if Yuya likes chest, she will also like to put his head on her own, causing Kaori to ask her if she is in love with Yuya, but she denies it and says no, although the fact is obvious to everyone. They return to their tents to sleep. That night, a bear appears at their tent and takes away almost all their vegetables. The next morning when the students wake up, they notice their tent has been ransacked. They wonder what it could be, especially since their personal items weren't affected. They decide to return to the forest and find breakfast, although Akira feels reluctant about going. He stands there, almost crying, but he can't tell his friends why. He reluctantly follows them, and in the forest, he notices some signs and watches. Yuya notices he is indifferent and goes to meet him. Yuya also notices the signs, but before they warn the girls, the bear has gotten nearer to them. They immediately start running outside the forest as the bear chases them. The teachers instructs them that they should find a barrier, and they run towards Sawada, who pushes them towards the barrier. As she runs after them, she falls, and the bear walks towards her. Yuya turns and sees Sawada in danger. He runs there and holds the bear. He fights the bear and weakens the bear. As the bear lies cold, Sawada goes to appreciate him for saving her. She says as his teacher, she should get angry at him for risking his life, but since he saved her, she will let it go. She asks him what he wants in return and if he wants her. He refuses the offer, so she says she will keep trying. They wonder what they should do to the bear, and Kaori makes some calls to the authority, and they decide to make the bear their school's guard bear. The field trip ends, and they return home. Yuya returns to the other world, and that is the same day he is meeting with the king. He goes to the forest to welcome Princess Lexia and her guards, and on his way, he sees some monsters. He assumes they are going to approach Lexia, so he fights them. After fighting the head, he gets a helmet in return. He wears the helmet to welcome Lexia and her guards. When they arrive, they ask him to enter the carriage so they can take him to the king, and he is about to tell them about his companion, Knight. Before he talks, Knight runs to Lexia and falls her, thereby almost causing an accident. Yuya cuts the tree that could have fallen on them, and he realizes that someone had targeted Lexia and Knight saved her. He goes into the forest to find the assassin. He attacks the assassin and finds out it is Luna. He is shocked. Lexia asks him if he knows Luna, so he confesses to her and begs her that he should take Luna home and take care of her because he doesn't think she is a bad person. Lexia accepts the idea and also asks to follow him. Yuya takes Luna home, and Lexia stays on the bed looking at the innocent-looking assassin. Yuya comes to meet her, and she tells him she feels Yuya has a very intimate relationship with Luna, and it makes her understand his idea of friendship and what friendship really means to him. Yuya denies having such special feelings for Luna, although he admits that they are friends and they knew each other some weeks ago. Lexia remembers that they were once in the darkest part of the forest, and suddenly, they found themselves at home. She feels concerned about that and asks Yuya what magic he used to bring them home from the darkest region of the forest. Yuya tells her it is teleportation magic. He says that he had created a teleportation link from the forest to his house so he can find it easy to travel from the forest back home. Lexia immediately jumps to meet him. She asks him if he doesn't know that teleportation magic is a great magic that barely exists in their world. It is known as legendary magic, and it is only read about in fantasy. Yuya doesn't know that the magic skill is that important. He tells Lexia that he didn't know, and Lexia informs him that the magic he used like a minor thing is enough to cause war between countries. She informs him that the magic is so powerful that if people know he has the power, it could cause war and lead to destruction. She warns him that he shouldn't use it in front of any other person. Yuya accepts her advice, and she turns to Luna, asking her how long she will pretend to be asleep and if she will wake up now. It turns out Luna was actually pretending to be asleep. Luna stands up and asks her how she knew she was pretending. Lexia laughs at her and tells her it is obvious to everyone that she is pretending, and even Yuya knows she is pretending. He only kept quiet and watched her because he wanted her to wake voluntarily. She admits that Yuya is a good friend and he really wants to protect her. She tells Luna that now that she is awake, she should tell them the story of how she got to the point of attempting to kill the princess. Luna refuses to talk. She tells Lexia there is no difference talking will make, and if Lexia wants to kill her, Lexia should kill her immediately because talking wouldn't change anything. Lexia tries to convince her, but she remains steadfast in her decision. Yuya eventually steps in. He tells her he is also interested in her story, 
and she should please tell them how she got there. Reluctantly, she begins the story. She informs them that she was an orphan who survived by scavenging waste. She would go around everyone's bins and raid it for what to eat. She looked so tattered and dirty, and eventually, she promoted to stealing from people to make a living. She will steal from people, run to ensure they don't catch her, and she continues like this until one day when she meets a man. Despite how she looked, this man looked at her and tapped her head. He drew her closer and brought her home. This was the first time she had a home, and eventually, this man taught her everything she knew. The man eventually became her master. He taught her how to read and write, but not only that, he also taught her the other skills of life that she knows. It turned out that all the skills her master taught her were channeled toward assassination. She found out her master was an assassin, and immediately she mentioned assassination. Lexia connects the dots and figures out her master is a member of the Dark Guild. Yuya isn't familiar with that world, so he doesn't know what the Dark Guild is, so Lexia explains to him that the Dark Guild is a secret organization that deals with all the evil thing that can be done. When you think of evil, you think of the Dark Guild. They murder, kidnap, steal, and other criminal activity. Luna continues her story. She tells them that she learned every skill of assassination from her master, and she eventually joined the Dark Guild. Upon joining them, she took on missions to survive, and she succeeded on several missions. She had never failed a mission, and as time went on, she became known as the notorious assassin, Headhunter. Lexia says she knows the name. She claims she had heard the name severally, and reports had been made to the king about the assassin. Luna says one day, just as usual, she got a mission to kill the princess of Arcelia, Lexia, which is the reason she had come to that part of the forest in the first place. Yuya is shocked to hear all these. He asks Knight if Knight knew who Luna was the first day they met her, and Knight nods in affirmation. Luna tells them that she is done with the story, and they can now kill her. Yuya wonders why she wants to die, and she explains to them that the instance she took that mission, her death was sure, and the moment she executed that mission, she had signed her execution so that even if the process didn't kill her, the Dark Guild would find out that she had failed the task, and they will send assassins to kill her. She tells Yuya that he has no reason to feel that much pity for her because she had lived a horrible life, and she only just met him a few weeks ago, and she doesn't have any special relationship with him, so he shouldn't care about her. Yuya screams at her, he admits they met just a few days ago, but it doesn't mean they aren't friends. He tells her he takes her as a friend and he won't allow her to die. However, she knows the reality that her death is sure, she feels the probability that Lexia will let her go is low, and even if she lets go, she won't survive from the Dark Guild. Lexia asks to speak for herself. She says she isn't interested in killing Luna, and she is going to give Luna an option. She tells her that she should work for her. She claims there is no way the Dark Guild will reach to her if she is the personal security guard of the princess, so Luna doesn't have to worry. Luna refuses. She wonders if Lexia has forgotten that Luna attacked her a few minutes ago. Lexia says she remembers, but it is only she and Yuya that know about the attack, so if they keep it a secret, there is no way anyone will know. She begs Luna to accept the offer and says she doesn't want Luna to die. On the other hand, Luna feels she doesn't deserve that second chance. She feels there is no way a devil like her can stay around a pure person like Lexia. She looks at her hands, remembering the number of people she has killed, and says she doesn't deserve any redemption. Lexia sees her looking at her hand. She holds the hand and compliments that Luna's hand is so soft. She asks Luna how she maintains a very soft hand despite the work she does. Luna attempts to tell her it was because of Yuya's bath, but she stops in the middle. Lexia gets angry. She jumps at Luna and tells her that in the instance she failed at her attack, she lost the fight. And since she lost the fight, she has to obey the command of the person who had won the fight. For that reason, she has no other choice than to become Lexia's personal guard. Luna eventually accepts, and she called Lexia her lord. Lexia is glad about that. She tells Luna that as her first command, she doesn't have to call her by her ceremonial name, and she should just call her Lexia. Luna calls her a chaotic princess and addresses her by her name. On the other hand, Lexia's captain and the other guards are being chased by monsters. Her captain prays, even on the verge of his death, that Lexia is fine. As the new friendship with Luna starts, Lexia asks her what she is saying about the bath, and Luna explains that Yuya has a bath that not only cleans the body but also heals every illness and makes one stronger. Lexia insists on using the bath, and she drags Luna to follow her. She asks Yuya if he wants to join them, but he says no. They get to the bath, and at the bath, Lexia asks Luna if she likes Yuya. Luna denies the accusation and says no, so Lexia tells her that since she doesn't like Yuya, she should have no issue with Lexia, 
and Yuya marries. Luna screams she can't think of such a possibility, and Lexia accuses her saying that if she doesn't like Yuya, there is no reason why she is bothered about who Yuya marries. Reluctantly, Luna admits that she admires Yuya as a fight mate and partner, but she doesn't know if she feels anything more than that for Yuya. Lexia sees that statement as a possibility of having feelings for Yuya, so she tells Luna that she is declaring war between them. Luna doesn't understand what she means by war and Lexia tells her that she is going to marry Yuya. Luna refuses to allow that, so she accepts the war. Eventually, Lexia declares that she will now take Luna as her rival and her guard. They return home to Yuya, who offers to cook their dinner, trying to compete for Yuya's heart. Lexia tells Yuya that she will like to cook the food, and he allows her. She takes the onion and attempts to cut it, but all her attempts prove abortive. The onion keeps falling off, and at a point, the knife falls from her hand and almost hits Yuya and Luna. Yuya asks to cook the food, he prepares the meal, and they really enjoy the food. They both keep competing for the heart, and Luna tells Yuya that he should feed her. He refuses to do that, but she tells him that she is injured and she finds it difficult to move, let alone eat. He remembers he was the one that attacked her, so with pity, he accepts to feed her. As he feeds her, Lexia gets jealous, she asks him to feed her, too. But when he refuses, she commands him as her princess, so he reluctantly feeds her. Later, they both ask to feed him food, and they force the food into his mouth. The girls sleep peacefully that night while Yuya is exhausted because of the stress he has gone through during the day. The following day, they return to the forest to meet the guards. The captain, Owen, is so glad to see that Lexia is safe, he claims they face some monsters the following day. But Lexia tells him she is fine. He sees that there are two other people with them, so Yuya introduces Knight to them and Owen appreciates Knight for saving Lexia. It's Lexia's turn to introduce Luna, and instead of doing a normal introduction, she reveals that Luna was the one who attempted to kill her the day before, but Luna is now her guard. Owen and the other guards become alerted against Luna, and they point their swords at her. Lexia begs them to calm down, and when they refuse to hear, she orders Luna to kill them. Luna doesn't heed to her command, so she realizes the command is wrong. She begs her guards, telling them that she slept beside Luna the night before and that if Luna wanted to kill her, she would have done so. They allow Luna to follow them, but Yuya tells them he can't go to the palace again. They describe the palace to them so he can visit himself. Before leaving, Luna runs to hug Yuya, appreciating him for what he has done and declaring the war. Lexia wants to do the same, but her carriage has left. After they leave, Yuya finds a river. As he sets it to bathe, he sees a Maoju and mistakenly tames it. He names the Maoju Akatsuki. He finds out the royal week has ended, and he returns to school. At school, his teacher tells them they are beginning the sports week, and they should compete with their strength because she will get a bonus if they win. They go for soccer training, and after they change into their dresses and stretch, they take positions to play the game. Yuya doesn't understand the rules, so he starts as a goalkeeper. His team has a very great player named Ryu who scores at every opportunity, so to make Yuya's team lose, Rin decides to distract Ryu. She asks Kid to jump with her body and with the distraction, another boy takes the ball from Ryu and tries to strike at Yuya's goalpost. But to their shock, Yuya saves the ball. Yuya asks what he should do to the ball, and they ask him to throw as hard as possible. When he throws the ball, the ball enters the opponent's goalpost, and everyone is amazed. Following the football competition that ended up badly for everyone who participated in it, the same one where he threw the ball directly to the goalpost of his opponent. He decides that football isn't for him. While that isn't far-fetched as it is obvious to people who are blind that he is terrible at it so he decides to go for ping pong game for the school soccer competition. Oh my god! Wow. As he joins the ping pong class, the students in the class with him wonder why he has joined that class. They expect that as the great student that he is, he would have so many skills that he could join the football or handball team. He explains to them that he found it difficult to do well on the football team, so he decided to try his hands on ping pong, hoping that he would do great. He leaves the training with his colleagues, and they all walk away. On their way, he hears his name by the back, and he turns to speak with the person who had called him. Upon turning to the back, he sees that it is the hiring manager from the model team that he had helped at the boutique some time ago. The hiring manager introduces himself as Kenji Kurosawa. He tells him that he has brought him a job and he should come and be a model for their company. The other students are amazed. No one could imagine that a student would be recruited by a great company like that. I'm sure you can't imagine it too. Anyways, the offer seems so testing and interesting that no one would be able to reject it. 
I guess that's what everyone thinks, but no one knows what Yuya is up to. To their shock, he rejects the offer. He tells them he isn't interested and says he had told them from the first day that he isn't cut fit for that lifestyle. And if he accepts it for the first time, he would find it difficult to reject it later on so it is better if he rejects it from the onset. The other students around him find what's happening unbelievable. It seems to be a fallacy that a student will reject an opportunity to be a star, an opportunity to sit with the big men and women in the entertainment agency, and become so popular. Several thoughts pass through the mind of those students. Some of them wonder if he had been in touch with the agency before. And the other students wonder what could have made him so special that the agency had to come to the school in search of him. Their questions can't find answers, and it even becomes so worse when they see the manager of the agency get angry at Kenji Kurosawa because he finds it difficult to convince Yuya. He reminds Kenji Kurosawa that he had promised he was going to come there and sweet-talk the boy into joining their agency, and until that happens, he isn't going to leave that place. He holds Kenji Kurosawa by his neck, telling him how much he is important to their company. At this point, I wonder if it is compulsory for Yuya to be featured in their weekly magazine. Miu, who is in the car listening to the conversation, gets uncomfortable with how it is going. She comes out of the car, and she brings out the episode of the magazine she had made with Yuuya, and shows the students. Miu is such a popular model, so her appearance doesn't need further introduction. The students are thrown off their feet. They all exclaim in joy, wondering how a well-known celebrity found her way into their school. Miu goes to meet her manager, telling him that the best way to convince Yuya isn't by making him feel inferior or forced and that they can do better. The manager reminds her that the reason he had brought her was so she could convince him that she should do the work she has come to do. Although they all know it is a futile attempt, she goes to talk to him. Before she gets to him, one of the school's student representatives walks beside them, and a flyer she holds falls off. The flyer falls directly on Yuya, and he picks it up. When he does so, the manager sees it as a flower about the school's sports competition. He asks the students what the competition is about, and when he gets the full information, his brain clicks on another special edition magazine. He decides that he will bring his team to video the competition, and that way, they will get another special magazine with Yuya without having to beg him and make him join their agency. They will be using one stone to kill two birds, and he immediately drags Kenji Kurosawa so they can meet with the school principal and make the plan. After that stressful school day, Yuya goes back to the other world. That's the only place he gets the peace he wants and lives the perfect life, and as usual, he goes to the forest to fight monsters. He attacks the first monster he finds, and he really finds it difficult to defeat the monster. He struggles with it with his pets, and eventually, he scatters the skull of the monster in the air. He sits with his pets and robs their body while considering that he is not as strong as he wishes to be. He admits that he is stronger than he was, but he feels he is still weak and he needs to train better. However, he also feels it is going to be impossible for him to increase that greatly if he is going to keep training on his own and he doesn't have anyone to train with him. In a bid to get better, he tells his pets that they should go inside the forest. He enters a path of the forest that he hasn't gotten before, and when he gets there, he feels a very scary atmosphere. He notices some very hard trees, so he uses his magic to find out what the trees are, and he sees that they are called the hard black trees. While he is amazed at how strong the trees are and how he hasn't seen such trees before, he gets distracted. Akatsuki notices that there is a terrifying monster behind them. Wait a minute! Who are you? He tries to call his attention to it, but he couldn't get his attention. The monster attacks them, and when he tries to defend himself, he falls off. His pets try to come to his rescue, but he also knows how strong that monster is. He knows if he allows his pets to go to his rescue, it will be their death. He screams at them and tells them to run away. He uses his magic to check the monster and he sees that it is a mithril boar. Have you ever been in a situation where you know you are confronted by something much more stronger than him? That is exactly the situation he is in presently. He could feel the terror of the monster he was fighting against, and the only thing on his mind was not how he will survive but how his pets will survive. He decides to keep defending himself until his pets run off. Suddenly, he hears a voice deep inside the forest, and the voice says he will help him. In that situation that he is, that has to be the most reassuring thing he could have wanted, but he is also scared that he doesn't know where the voice is coming from. Suddenly, something kicks the boar and it falls. The creature comes out from inside the forest, and he sees the voice speaking to him as that of a rabbit. The boar regains his strength and tries to fight back, 
but the rabbit says, disappear, and the boar dies. There is a sense of gratitude in his mind, but he also feels fear. Who is this rabbit? Why can the rabbit talk? These are all the questions that are in his mind. He sees that the rabbit is a kick rabbit, and the rabbit says he wants them to show him their kick. Akatsuki goes to show his kick first, but the rabbit says the kick is without hope. Knight goes next, and the rabbit says although his kick has hope, it is also weak. He goes last, the rabbit comments that he is stronger than the other two, but he has to prove his strength. The rabbit shows them his kick. As he kicks the hard trees, the trees fall off in succession. He tells Yuya to do the same, but he finds it impossible. After his futile attempts, the rabbit asks that they train together. They spend the entire day training before they retire to the house. At that point, he doesn't know what the rabbit wants, so he asks, and the rabbit tells him the reason he is training him that hard is that he wants him to be his successor. Yuya doesn't know what to say. Being someone's successor isn't a decision you make in split seconds, and he is so shocked he doesn't even know the person in front of him, so how will he accept such a responsibility? The rabbit introduces himself as Yuzaki. He tells him he is divine, and the divine title is one that is given to any person who has mastered his skills so much that there is not a superior in that skill. As for him, his skill is the kick skill, and he has mastered it so much that he has been bestowed of that title by the gods. As the divine, he has the responsibility of training someone to take over his duty and master the skill and he needs to find a successor. Yuya wonders what they do that makes them that worldly, and Yuzagi explains to him that they are the ones in charge of the vices on earth. He tells him that vices are creatures created by the malice of earth. He says when these vices form, they cause commotions on earth, and the divines are the ones who put the earth in the way he should. Yuya wonders if it is compulsory for him to take the position. Although Yuzagi tells him it is not compulsory, he also tells him that the world is filled with vices and there is a need for warriors. Yuya concludes that although he wishes to reject it, he has people he wants to protect in that world. And if becoming a divine will makes that possible, then he doesn't have a choice. He accepts, and Yuzagi also asks that he teaches him magic. They go for the first training, where he is asked to fight the king boar as revenge for what the former boar did to him. He fights, and he wins. After the fight ends, Yuzagi tells him that there are also two classes ahead of King Boar, which are the SSS and X. He suddenly starts feeling weird. He sees he has gotten an evolution, and he wonders if it wouldn't affect his usual self since he has the ball competition the following day at school. The following day, the school sets for the competition, the manager comes with his directors, and he tells them that they must capture all that Yuya does. He plays the ping-pong competition against an opponent who doesn't seem to be a student of their school. The opponent is very violent, and he hits the ball with great velocity. He wins the game after much stress, and he gives up. As he tries to rest, Kita calls him and says that one of the students in her volleyball game got injured. She drags him to join her team, and despite that, the way he serves is too hard. He wins the game although he injures the students and he also destroys the environment. Well, a win is a win. As he tries to rest, he sees Kaori disturbed. He goes to where she is playing tennis and sees one of her players is injured. He joins her to play the game. The injured students tells him that their opponent is so strong and he should watch out for her serve. The boy had been injured after one of the serves hit his face, and his face was swollen. He joins the fight, and he immediately figures her opponent is quite strong. But he keeps holding off, and again, he wins the game. It is all wins for Yuya on this day, although the day was quite stressful for him. On his way home, he sees Kaori, who offers to take him out as a thank you gift for what he did that day. He rejects the offer, and as they cross the road, she asks him to close his eyes, and when he does so, she gives him a peck on his cheek although he doesn't know what she did. The manager of the model agency finishes his special edition magazine. He is excited at the work of his hand, and he is so glad that he has found a way to bring Yuya into the magazine. He feels that with that magazine being sold, Yuya will get a lot of attention, and he will find it difficult to reject the offer of being a model. His director, however, asks him how he intends to bring Yuya to their team. He claims that if the magazine gets produced, Yuya will get more attention, and there will be several organizations that would like Yuya to join them. As a result, Yuya will have a lot of choices, and he can decide not to join their agency. The manager insists that is the reason why he had done that, and with the magazine being produced and sold, Yuya won't be able to avoid being a model. There will be obstacles for him, so he will have no choice but to join their agency. He encourages his manager that they will get the entire thing done, and he orders the sales and marketing of the magazine. 
On the other hand, Yuya receives his first female visitor to his house. The visitor is no one else but Kaori. She meets Knight and Akatsuki, and she comments that they are very cute. She sits to study with him, and she helps him out with a mathematical equation. After he gets the problem solved, he appreciates her for helping him study well, and she reminds him that he had also helped her learn the English language well and also the Japanese language. He recalls that he had learned those languages in the other world, and he mistakenly says that out. She asks him what he means, and when he finds out he has revealed what shouldn't be revealed, he apologizes and keeps quiet. I am sure you are wondering how she had visited his house and how they had come to the decision to study together. Recall that after the sports competition, Kaori caught up with Yuya to appreciate him for helping her in her competition, as they can together that day. She reminds him that their examination is coming soon and asks him how is his preparation. Immediately she asks that question, and his mood and countenance change. She asks him what is wrong with him, and he confides in her that he has issues with mathematics and can't seem to understand it at all, so he doesn't know how he will pass. She smiles at him, telling him she doesn't know that a person who is good at everything like him can be bad at something. She says mathematics is simple, and she asks if she can bring up a suggestion. Yes, she asks him if it is possible for them to have revisions together in his house and study together. Since he most likely needs her help in mathematics, he accepts to study with her and invites her home. That's how they had gotten to the stage where they are. As they study, she tells him she feels pressed, and she will like to urinate. He describes the restroom to her, but he doesn't follow her there. As she enters, he wonders if he is doing good because that is the first time he has had a female visitor in his house. When she tries to go to the toilet, she finds her way towards the door to the other world. As she is about to enter subconsciously, Yuya comes there. I am sure his mind has traveled into several places before he asks her what she is doing there, as that is not the way to the toilet that he had described to her. She admits that she knows that is not the way, but in the process of going to the toilet, she claims something from that room called her nearer which is why she had come there. She accepts that what she has done could be wrong, and she apologizes for infringing on his privacy. However, he asks her if she will believe him if he tells her the door she is standing in front of is the entrance to another world. She doesn't understand what he means, she wonders what another world means, and he walks nearer to her. He tells her that she should put her hand towards that door, and when she puts her hand there, she sees that there is actually an invincible lock there. He explains to her that the door leads to the other world, and the door can only open for a person he authorizes. At this point, she understands what he means by a door, but she is still confused as to what he means by another world. She asks him if he means a new world, and he tells her he means precisely what he had said, a new world and another world that is different from Earth. He claims the world has several skills that aren't on Earth, and magic also exists in that world. He says that he has learned several magic skills in that world, and he shows her. He calls for water from the sky, and when she sees it, she is shocked. She touches it, and she confirms that it is really water. She eventually understands what he means, and he asks her if she wants to follow him to the other world. She accepts, and they enter together. When they arrive at his compound in the other world, she is so shocked. She asks him if that is indeed a new world that is different from Earth, and he tells her, yes, she checks the fruits and the vegetables in that world, and she admits that it is really different from the ones she knows. He tells her that is the world he met Knight and Akatsuki. He explains to her that Knight is from the little Fenrir species, a species that is just like wolves, while he doesn't know which species Akatsuki is from. He claims he has found out that Akatsuki is from the Manju species, but he doesn't know what the Manju species means. He asks her if she knows what the Manju species means, and she admits she doesn't know that species. He suggests that it could be the same as the pig species, but when he says it, he sees that Akatsuki gets angry at him, so they both assume they are wrong. Knight comes to show Akatsuki a prey, and they both leave to catch it, leaving the two young ones alone. Kaori sees a system opening in front of her and asks Yuya what it is, he tells her it is called stats in that world, and when he checks her stats, he says that her stats is higher than his own. He tells her that when he came to that world, he was the lowest of low, he was fat, and he wasn't able to relate with anyone. He says he had leveled up in that world, and he doesn't know how he lost weight and suddenly gained muscles. He claims all the powers he had been exhibiting in the normal world were all gotten from that world, including the one he used when bandits attacked their school, and when the school got burnt, and he saved her. She actually doesn't care about all the stories he is saying, but he keeps up with it regardless. He tells her that what he means is that he has been using a cheat, and there is no way he could have been able to relate with people like them if he wasn't using such a cheat. She smiles at him and asks him to take her to the forest.
He refuses and tells her that there are monsters in the forest. He explains to her that the only reason monsters aren't coming inside that building is that there is a barrier inside the building. She asks him if he will take him there another time, and he promises to do that, so she raises her hand and makes a pinky promise sign with him. He also begs her to keep what he has told her as a secret, and she accepts to do so. She makes another pinky promise to him, asking him if the presence of that secret between them makes their relationship special. He pretends not to understand her, so she claims she doesn't want an answer. However, she feels that the fact that he could share those things with her makes her special. He then asks them to return to the other world and study for their examination. On the other hand, Lexia returns home, and she greets her father. After she shares greetings with her father, her father asks Owen why the boy they had gone to bring isn't with them. Owen apologizes on Yuuya's behalf and tells the king that due to circumstances, they couldn't come with Yuuya. The king asks them if the circumstances involve the new guard, Luna, they had brought. Before Owen replies, Luna steps in and says yes, she says that she is an assassin and she had attempted to kill Lexia, but failed. The king then asks her why she is still alive. He reminds her that for an assassin, she should know that the result of a failed assassination is death, so she should be dead already. She tells him that she also offered to die, but the person who had hired her as a guard refuses to let her die, so the king says he will do what his daughter refused to do. He takes his great sword to kill Luna, but before he gets to her, she restricts his hand. He wonders how she was able to stop that sword. Lexia also gets angry at her father for fighting her friend and says she hates him. He apologizes and accepts Luna as Lexia's guard. He asks Luna to help him lose the bind she has tied him with. The king, Arnold, meets with Owen later on, and Owen tells him that it was Yuya who saved Lexia again. He also tells him Luna is the great assassin of the Dark Guild, which is named Headhunter. Arnold says Luna is very skilled, and Owen explains that after Yuya saves Lexia, he takes her to his house with Luna, and they spend the night there. The king gets angry, he claims he hasn't given Yuya the right to meet his daughter inappropriately, and it is disrespectful. He says he will kill Yuya when he arrives. On the other hand, the prince meets with his spies, who inform him about Lexia's failed assassination. He also tells him Luna has become Lexia's guard and Yuya will be coming to the city soon to meet the king. The prince assumes that although he will become the king, it isn't a bad idea if he becomes the king earlier or faster than he should. He tells the assassin that he will give him his secret, which is his magic barrier portion. He asks that they will release the portion so no one will be able to use magic, and after that, they shall fight and kill Arnold, Lexia, Luna, and Owen since they are the only ones who can use swords. The assassin reminds him that if things go south, he will be killed, so he claims he wants to use that opportunity because there is someone he can lay the blame on. He asks that they shift the blame on Yuya after the king is killed. Yuya gets a holiday from school after the sports festival. He decides to use the opportunity to visit the king and Lexia. On his way, he kills some sheep, and he gets the sheep's fur, horn, and also beddings created from the sheep's body. He starts traveling, and when he gets to the first village, he is excited at everything he sees. He sees creatures with tails and recalls he doesn't have money to spend in that city, so he goes to sell products in exchange for money. When he enters the store, the merchant accuses him of being noble. He sells pepper to the merchant, who claims it is the highest quality pepper he has ever seen. He takes his gold coins, and he continues his journey after the merchant describes where he will get a carriage. He arrives at the royal capital, gets to the palace, and Owen takes him to the king. Arnold is initially angry that he has spent the night with his daughter and even says he has seduced his daughter. The chiefs around control Arnold and asks him to be calm. He eventually asks Yuya what gift he has brought. Yuya hasn't brought any gift to him. He feels bad about that, and he brings out the bedding he got from the sheep. Everyone in the room is shocked. The king gets furious and asks why Yuya will disrespect his daughter in such a manner. He brings out his sword to attack Yuya, but Owen intervenes, saying Yuya doesn't know that giving bedding in their kingdom signifies you want to take the lady away. He tries to apologize, and the assassins jump in. They activate the barrier assuming no one can use magic there, but Yuya defeats them all. Happily, Lexia goes to hug Yuya, and her father gets furious at Yuya. He raises his sword at Yuya and Lexia gets angry at him. She confronts him, asking why he would do that when Yuya has just saved them. In his defense, he claims he has no other choice seeing how she hugged Yuya. As they argue, Owen, who is tying the assassins, finds a sum of money and a crest in the assassin's pocket. 
he shows the king that the crest belongs to Riger, Lexia's brother. Owen immediately goes to Yuuya, asking him to lend them his skills because their kingdom is in trouble. Just as Yuuya and the king exchanged glances because of the way Alexia had hugged Yuuya after Yuuya had defeated the assassins, Owen calls their attention to a badge that he had found on the body of one of the assassins sent to kill the king and Lexia. The badge turns out to be that of Prince Riger, who has sent the assassins. Following that, Owen realizes that the kingdom is in danger, and if the prince could send assassins to kill his sister and father, they need a better power to tackle that rebellion. He immediately goes to meet the only person who he thinks has the power to help them, and he begs for Yuya's help. Later that day, Yuya stands in front of the door as he overhears the guards gossiping about what had happened earlier that day. The guards say that the king had entered his chambers unhappily that day after he heard what had happened and no one really knows what could be the result of what had happened. Yuya recalls that Owen had told him earlier that they needed him to protect Lexia because it may not be easy for them to do that on their own, and they also needed him to curb the rebellion that had started in their city. He accepted to stay with them in the palace to protect Lexia, and he tries to visit Lexia in her room. He first itches his hair, thinking of what to do as he stands in front of Lexia's room. Just as he summons the courage to open the door, Lexia coincidentally opens the door too. With his hands still high in the sky, she looks at him without asking him what he had come to visit her for. She tells him she knows he is new to their city and it is very important for him to check out his new environment. She offers to take him out to the city so he can have a better view of their city. The reason she wants to do that isn't far-fetched. First, she is bored of staying in that room alone. And she also wants to have a private time with Yui. Although Yui could have happily accepted her offer because he is also excited to be in that new world, but before he could accept or reject the offer, Luna walks to meet them. Luna reminds Lexia that they aren't in a time of pleasure and she should remember that she is a target of assassins. She insists that Lexia shouldn't go anywhere and Lexia should remain in her room where they can be sure she is safe. Lexia admits that they are really in a scary time. She, however, believes that it isn't that tough of a time, and since everyone already knows that it is her brother who has been sending assassins to her, it is easy for them and if her brother sends any more assassin, he will be revealing his location to them, and he will be caught so a person with logic like her brother wouldn't even bother to make any other attempt. Luna also knows she is right. She tells Lexia that although Lexia is right, she is very sure that is not the reason Lexia wants to go out. Lexia says that is not her sole reason. She admits the reason she wants to leave the palace is because she is bored, and that is quite expected for anyone because she has been there for a while. She also claims she feels it will be better if they show Yuya around so he will know and see how beautiful their city is. Owen arrives behind them, and he looks at the girls as they argue. He doesn't interfere in the argument, and all through the argument, even Yuya doesn't talk. Since Lexia claims the reason she wants to go out is to show Yuya around, Luna volunteers as her guard to do that for her. She says she will take Yuya around the city and show him the great views. As you can expect, the decision doesn't go well with Lexia who immediately flares up and says that there is no way she will allow Luna to have a private time with Yuuya. If you remember, they are both rivals to take the heart of Yuuya, and the first to get Yuuya's love wins. Lexia can't take chances, so she insists she wouldn't allow Luna to go out with Yuuya. Owen sees that the argument will not end anytime soon, so he decides to help them out. He tells the girls that since they can't decide who will show Yuuya around the city, he is volunteering to do so, and the girls should stay at home. At that moment, a rare uniform decision was made by the girls. They immediately scream at Owen, and they tell him that they wouldn't allow that. Since they have decided as regards what they want, they eventually take Yuya out to the marketplace together. To ensure the safety of Lexia, Owen stays about a few kilometers behind them, and he watches them as they move to ensure the safety of the princess. They eventually arrive at the marketplace. Yuya is delighted with the things he sees there, but the two girls are still competing about who will impress him the most. Lexia asks that they go and check out the jeweler, and as she tries to drag Yuya towards the jeweler's store, Luna drags him back. Luna feels it is better if they go to check out the smithy, and she claims it is a better view. Lexia refuses to believe that. She tries to convince Yuya that the smithy is a very rowdy place, and he wouldn't like the view, so he should support her, and they should go to the jeweler. Yuya doesn't say a word, and he keeps looking at them as they argue. The girls try to prove dominance, so they hold Yuya in both of their hands and drag him toward themselves. Yuya's dress is enough to draw attention because he wears aren't the type that is common in that society, so as you can expect, all the passerby around set their glances on Yuya. They comment that he must be a noble because of the elegant way which he had dressed. 
His clothings are elegant and beautiful, and he is also so handsome. They comment that not only is he handsome, but he also has two pretty girls around him, and they are very close to him. Yuya indeed notices that there are a lot of people looking at him. He tries to use his skill to check out the type of eyes and if any one of the people looking at them has bad intentions. He realizes that there are no bad eyes around, so he continues his journey. He sees the signage of the Adventurer Guild. Although he has never been to one before, he is attracted to what he sees. He stands and looks at it, and the girls notice that the signage draws his attention. They ask him if he would like to register as an adventurer. He tells them that on his way to the royal capital, he had registered at the Merchant Guild. But he doesn't know much about the Adventurer Guild, so he doesn't know if he wants to register or not. Luna tells him that the Merchant Guild registration is best for an identification card, and if he register at the Guild, he would be able to sell all his hunting proceeds at a higher rate, and he will also be able to take missions and get rewarded for his missions. He decides it will really be a good experience for him in that world, and he will like it. Luna also says she will follow him. She walks towards the door to register, but Lexia protests. Lexia claims Luna has no right to register as an adventurer. She is her guard, and she should remain by her side. In response, Luna tells her that she doesn't stay by her side every time, and she also feels registering as an adventurer will be a good opportunity for her to make money, so she really wants to do it. She tells Lexia that if she is really against the idea, then she should register too. They enter into the guild, and Lexia follows them. Even inside the guild, she keeps convincing them not to register, but there is not much her words can do. Yuya and Luna meet with the attendant, who gives them the registration form to fill out. When Yuya starts to fill it, he asks her if he needs to register his pets, but the lady tells him he doesn't need it. He sees a part in the form where they ask for the type of magic they use. He wonders if he can put all magic, but he remembers the words of the rabbit about some advanced magic and how it is not welcomed, so he puts air, fire, and water. He also sees the part for magic measurement, and the attendant tells them that they have to measure their magic by putting their hands on the crystal. Luna goes first, and she gets the yellow color, However, when Yuya does his own, the crystal breaks. The attendant admits that it is possible for the crystal to break when the adventurer has magic greater than the power the crystal can accept. Yuya asks if he has to pay for the damages they will incur, but the lady tells him no. She goes inside to submit the form that they had filled out, and she returns with their adventurer card. She tells them that since they are just registering, they will be starting from rank F since Yuya doesn't know much about adventuring. He asks her if there is a minimum of missions they can take, but the young lady tells them there is no limit although if you take a request and you get extra items, you will be rewarded with extra money. The only thing is that they should ensure they do not uproot all plants because if they do so, they won't grow again. She introduces herself as Emil, and she wishes them well in their duty. They move to the quest board, and Lexia excitedly goes to check. She tells them that even though she isn't an adventurer, she will like to join them. As they argue with her, a drunk adventurer comes to meet them. She calls Yuya handsome and hugs him. The girls get jealous, and Lexia decides that considering what is happening at the guild, it will be better if she joins them, so they should pick a mission that will be easy for them. They eventually pick the request to gather healing herbs. They go to the forest, and Owen keeps watching Lexia. As they start picking the herbs, Lexia suggests that she and Luna has a competition where they will gather herbs, and Yuya will decide who gathered the most. She says the winner will get an exclusive time with Yuya, and she runs to start gathering herbs. Yuya also gathers herbs with his pets. Suddenly, they notice that Owen is missing. Yuya says he saw Owen toward the tree earlier, and he saw Owen saying some things. He goes there, and they see Owen and the other guards coming with their horses. Owen tells Yuya that the prince has been found and they have to arrest him before he escapes. Owen tells Lexia and Luna to return home, and he begs Luna to take care of Lexia. They give Yuya a horse to ride. As they ride, Yuya remembers that Owen had told him that day that if the prince isn't restrained, he could cause division in the city, and the assassins which the prince had hired are professionals, so they need a better hand which is why they need him. He asks Owen where the prince is at the moment, and Owen tells him the prince is at the isolated cabin that the king had restricted for him. They arrive there, but before entering, Yuya feels the place is too empty. They wonder if the other guards that had come to restrict the prince were successful. But when they get inside, they see that the prince is holding one of them at ransom and claiming he will kill the guard if they come nearer to him. Yuya sends Knight to distract the prince, and he attacks him. They eventually restrain the prince, but before they handcuff him, a strange being enters the building. The prince admits that she was the one who asked him to do all he did. 
but she tells him that he had failed and he now has to die. She attempts to kill him, but a spear flies to restrict her. She turns to the people and she starts attacking them. She tells them that her mission isn't restricted to them and the city, but her mission is to destroy the world. Fortunately, Yuya defends the people with his barrier. Owen mentions Yuya's name, and she recognizes Yuya as a powerful person. She says she has used all her mana, and she has to retreat. She leaves, promising to return again. At the episode's end, Kaori goes to Yuya's house.